Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or good day, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to the next episode of No Dice, No Glory. Sponsored by our jobs that actually pay us money, we're coming to you not at all live from an abandoned arms factory deep under a mountain in West Virginia. We are proud to proffer to you the finest in wargaming coverage. Without any further ado, let's get this show on the road. Hey, well, welcome, everybody, uh, to another installment of the No Dice, No Glory podcast. And we are here live from Historicon 2022 in beautiful Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Joined with me, uh, my tag team and my room partner, Tom Elaine. Tom, how you doing today? I'm doing pretty great, Mitch. Yeah, we got to get Tom a little closer. Yeah, I'm doing pretty great, Mitch. Are you doing pretty great? I am. Yeah. We had a snoring contest. I yeah. Think, I think you won, but... You said I was talking in my sleep. So you were. You were. Who yeah. knows what secrets I revealed? Well, I mean, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that uh, one of the talesmen, Glenn Van Meter, could not make it. Um, in order to respect his and his family's privacy, uh, we're just going to con- kind of label it as what a flapjacking incident. He was. He was flapjacking. He was flapjacking. It so went badly. It went. It did not go well. And for those that uh, know Glenn. And um, hopefully Glenn can listen to this someday. Um, our heartfelt, uh, we hope he's on the mend. Let's just put it like that. There have been a lot of bearded guys floating <laughs> around, and I'll, I'll see them out of the corner of my eye and think it's Glenn, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, what did he say? It was a cross between an um, uh, Amish guy and a homeless guy. That's what uh, Rufus said, right? That's very cruel, but also very accurate yeah it's very accurate yeah i think it looks like you know one of the chicago seven but um i i don't know which one so any any any, not the one that married jane fonda or something like that well so so anyway um um we are here we're running a uh ton of stuff tom tell us about our events so we have the uh the firelock iron man which began uh, yesterday. So me and Mitch got here on Wednesday. We started setting up. Uh, we found plenty of ne'er-do-wells floating around. Uh, we learned late that Glenn was not going to be here, so we had to make some adjustments. Um, but Glenn was still kind enough to send his partner in crime, the man who shall be not be named, Preston Jacka, with all of his terrain, because Preston's a good friend. Um, and Tyler, uh, Tyler Stone... Showed up, ran Oak and Iron. We had yeah. eight for that yesterday. And uh, we just kicked off a little Blood and Valor. They're just getting started now. And we got two events left. So um, we're looking at um, Blood and Plunder Land and then Blood and Plunder Sea. Yeah, I will be TOing Blood and Plunder Lands this afternoon. And then in my hubris, uh, we, we got going with the sea tournament. I brought my ship. I'm ready to, to fight the Lucky Duck yeah. on the open seas. I'm excited to do this. There's a, there's a couple guys that brought a bunch of ships, so yeah. we'll see yeah. how it goes. And, you know, it's, you know, he says my hubris. I, you know, you kind of wonder if it's, if it's almost too much of a good thing, because I think everybody likes Blood and Plunder land. S- not everybody has ships, and I know the guys that have ships want to play with ships, so <clears throat> we'll kind of have to see how that whole thing goes. But, you know, once again, it was great seeing uh, Rufus, Kai, um, Keegan, uh, Mike, and all the guys from Firelock Games. So yesterday we did some walking around. We met some interesting folks yesterday. One, we did. Love talking to, uh, to Nelson from um, um, Mythico Studios. I know he's going to kill me. We'll try to get him on later. And then um, Lee Gaddis from Gaddis Games. I, I thought he was very interesting to talk to. Yeah, I bought his book. Um, he's also a guy who's worked with students. He's built an entire really accessible module. Yeah. Uh, that, that talks about African American history and you know the segregated army, but kind of singles out some of the highlights in terms of like really brave guys that, that were on the, the spear front of the of the fight. Yeah. Like in, you know in terms of Patton's guys and stuff like that. So it's it's a rule set. I often struggle getting the average kid involved. We'll see in these if we things. could get him on a little bit yeah, later. Yeah, we will. I'll yeah. go bug him. Yeah, I really like him. So yeah, I mean it's uh, you know we got the con going. I will and, say uh, Blood and Steel was doing a brisk business earlier today as well. Yeah, uh, most we're, certainly, most certainly. There were a lot of people asking about it. They had a special going, so they, they were running a lot of demos over at that table, and I was running Blood and Plunder pretty much all day yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So look, you know uh, we're going to probably come back to you with some really good interviews, but uh, 
you know, the con up oh, here, the the uh, the vendors the, hall is opening. The grand doors. Yeah, and it's uh, you know, just uh, 12 minutes too late. So uh, we're probably going to head over there. But hey, you know, uh, I'm happy to be back at a big old live historic con here in uh, beautiful Lancaster, and um, you know, we're going to take a quick break. And we'll be back with some really interesting folks. Hey, well, welcome back. Um, we're here with our first interview. And you guys know we're huge fans of the uh, Lead Pursuit podcast, the uh, podcast that focuses on Blood Red Skies. Matter of fact, Blood Red Skies would probably be crashed and down in flames if it wasn't for these guys. And you guys know I love Doug, but we, t- we have Mike D'Agostino, who's like the mystery member of... Um, Lead Pursuit Podcast. Sir, I mean, if I got that wrong, please tell me. You did. Uh, unfortunately, you know, true to Blood Red Skies form, we didn't get an actual name badge for somebody for Blood Red Skies. So I'm uh, masquerading as Mike today. This is Steve with Lead Pursuit doing some uh, BRS demos. BRS, that's Blood Red Skies for those that are uninformed. I so, did think you looked handsomer. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm it's a pretty safe bet that Mike is probably better looking than Steve, so we'll just we'll just go with it. You're a good looking man. Hey, well, I somebody mean, has to with the A lot other of guys, people you know? in our audience are gonna be like, That's a good looking man. That's good to know. The camera's over there. It's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So how's your con been so far? It's been good. Uh, yeah, a couple demo games. Spent a spent a little bit of time with the Mythico Studios guys. Love those uh, guys. Great, Nelson. Great as always. Great as always. Hit the uh, the bargain basement. Look for some. Did you get any good bargains? Uh, What'd you buy? Oh who, man. Who are you wearing? I don't know if I could tell you. My wife might hear this podcast. And I doubt of, it. You know, no, no, you're just no, the only, no risk of that. only female listener. Maybe. I don't know. No, I doubt it. Uh, man, you know, I actually uh, was looking at some more bolt action stuff, which will Uh-oh. probably run some more of our listeners away but hey, you can't fight bolt action those 28 millimeter guys are fun to paint they are fun to paint i need to get my painting mojo back on so i don't know i have that so you, you ran some demos of blood red skies let's let's talk about the new hotness in blood red skies and i think it's the battle of something um a uh, halfway halfway <laughs> the battle of halfway battle of halfway <laughs> no it's battle of midway battle of midway is the new starter set uh Wildcats and Zeros in that box uh, pretty much took over for the Battle of Britain starter set. The resin models are really nice in it. They look nice. They, I saw yours are painted. Nice they're models. really nice. Uh, yeah, and they actually just came out with the uh, new card set too, the Ops Room card set. So if you just need the paper products, you have your own models or you have the Airstrike rule book, but you were looking for the cards, the uh, Ops Room cards deck is also available now for Blood Red Skies. So, you know, we want, we hope, we pray that these games somewhat represent history. So with Blood Red Skies, and I, I, I'm a Mig Alley guy, it's pretty accurate, but like you look at the Zero against the Wildcat, it took some learning for those Wildcat pilots to knock out those Zeros. How's the game play? Uh, plays good. Uh, yeah, you know, they're very evenly matched the way they do with the traits in the starter box. Uh, so the starter box is a really even match. Uh, the cool thing about Blood Red Skies, you could play it real historical, uh, but it does does play pretty well in a tournament, too, the way it's pointed out. You can do some abstract stuff with that. But uh, the, the real thing with Blood Red Skies is the narrative type stuff. It plays really good narratively. The narrative scenarios in the new Midway box are pretty good. Uh, LPP knows a little bit about that, right? A little bit. Yeah, we have a hopefully soon a campaign book coming out that we published. Really? Uh, it's been kind of in the wings. If with you're waiting Warlord. for Doug to write it, he doesn't have enough crayons. Yeah, I, I don't know, Doug. You know, he's ma- he's you know gallivanting around the world right now over somewhere doing his thing. He's but, a budgie uh, smuggler. <laughs> I, that's what I love calling him. So it sounds like there's a, like a lot of stuff that's exciting because, okay, I'm not going to knock Warlord, but. It came out, and I, 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 I got the Battle of Britain stuff. I, I got a few extra packs, and then Mig Alley went whole hog into, or, you know, like we call full gamer on. Um, but then there was nothing for quite some time. Yeah, it did, it did take quite a while for the Midway release to come out. That was kind of the ongoing joke. We weren't sure if it got stuck in, a, you know, was it the Suez Canal on Suez that Canal. merchant ship? It might have got backed up there, or uh, COVID supply chain shortage, or who? Who knows what it was, but it came out and uh, it's Mad been out Cow. for about six months Mad now. Mad cow. <laughs> Mad cow disease. 
uh, yeah, you monkey know, pox, avian flu, monkey pox. I don't know, but something happened with it. But it's here, and uh, it was worth the wait. And I, you know, I'll tell you what. For an American audience, let me ask Tom here because he's, sure. he's very quiet. Like, what would you rather play, Battle of Britain or Battle of Midway, for a game like Blood Red Skies? Uh, Battle of Midway. All my relatives have fought in World War II, fought in the Pacific. Yeah. So you know, you look at you know. U.S. and I think that was a problem when the game came out. It's like Battle of Britain. Hey guys, Warlord is an English company. So yeah, I you mean, know, nobody here really wants to play with Spitfires. Let's just be honest. You know, oh, Spitfires Mustangs, are cool. Mustangs, it's a beautiful Mustangs. plane. It's a beautiful plane. Mustangs, Corsairs, P forty sevens. How many versions of Spitfires are in the game now? How many do they make? Are they like 47 versions of Spitfires? Mark uh, 60? It was I don't just know. about 47, yeah. yeah. With the marks and the, yeah, uh, the dots. I mean, they just, I guess that's just the, you know, not to, I don't know how many British listeners you have. They're just not creative enough to come up with a new plane name or like, what was it? What's the deal with that? I don't know. Uh, I, it, yeah, it's, it's beyond me. Like, how many tornadoes have they had or typhoons? <laughs> I mean, it's, come on, dude. So, just something different, right? <laughs> yeah. So, what, what have you guys at LPP? would like to say, you know, our brethren there, uh, except for Doug, um, have you seen, like, what's the reaction been out there for this new box set? Oh, really good, actually. You know, it was actually kind of a bummer. I thought the game was going to totally die out if it didn't come, but it came out, and the the reaction's been really, really good. Uh, They just released a whole bunch of new resin, some of their older metal planes, that they recast them in resin, and they look really good. And uh, especially with a card deck coming out now, hoping to get a little bit of a little boost back up into sales of Blood Red Skies. Rumored that Italians are on the horizons with Blood Red Skies. Yeah, I heard that before. So we'll see. I, uh, once again, we know John Starler, if you're listening, we still love you. Um, so one question I wanted to ask. Well, let me, let me hit him with one last personal question. Is what's your favorite? If, if I don't listen to LPP, which you should, but I don't personally. No, um, What's your, fav- what's your favorite aircraft in the game and why? Uh, F4U Corsair. Really? I mean, Baba Black Sheep. Yeah. I mean, Robert Conrad. You got that but remember, n- it was nostalgia. A, yeah. a plane that the Marines flew, so it had to have been kind of easy to fly. Great, yeah, great airplane. Looks cool. Durable. It had a it's, long lifespan. Yeah, it flew into the, I mean, 50s almost in yeah. some places, right? I'm reading that book about the guy that landed to pick the other guy oh, up. Oh, Devotion, yeah. They're New making movie a movie coming out in October. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can't cool. wait. Yeah. So both of these guys are teachers, and I know right away some people are calling Child Protective Services right now oh, uh, to kind of complain <laughs> oh, about it. I just lost my job. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Staying with um, Mitch in this hotel is all it took for me to do that. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So I know Tom uses board games in his class. Have you ever used Blood Red Skies to Man, teach physics? I would, I would love to... Uh, yeah, it seems like a lot of work, though. What do you mean? It is a lot of work. Then you want to put you want to put that much work into doing something like that? I mean, Tom is obviously a very overachieved, distinguished teacher. Must have great well, he evaluations. Well, he was. He was. Now he has to wear the badge of shame. Hopefully, <laughs> no, nobody you teach with listens to this podcast. I love you, Tom. But uh, you know, like just using like you know physics when I was trying to explain you know, to my I son. Did, I so I actually do teach uh, some CAD and some 3D modeling. So I did actually use wargaming for a 3D modeling project where I had kids design uh, like mech robots and nice. do some 3D printing. Nice. Oh, so cool. I did that. That was kind of cool. I've thought about getting a. Uh, Maybe some Gaslands going on. That could be a good one. For everybody loves that game. Everybody loves that game. Seems pretty simple. I've never played it, but how hard could it be? There's you know, a lot of... Just quickly speaking about 3D printing, one of my students this past year, as his final project, designed a game. And he was, he said, oh, I'm just going to 3D print you know, all these models. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if you've done this before. I said, you can just borrow all my models, and you, know, you have a rule set. You wrote it up. You've done what you need to do. I, why don't you just use my models? He's like, no, no, no. I'm going to print them out. And I'm like, well, when are you going to do that? Because this is due in two days. And he goes, I'll just do it tomorrow night. And, and <laughs> Wait, was, it, was this individual's name Tyler Stone? Uh, no, no, no. But he, yeah, he, he, he's like, it jammed up. It's not working. I'm like, well, we've learned a valuable lesson because this is a long process. Yeah. But yeah. I'm glad yeah. you're teaching Printing kids a long process, how to play yeah. with it. So, yeah, we, so we did that. We don't want to keep you too long. I'm not trying to stop this, but, you know, I could talk to you forever. Because I, I, believe it or not, I like him and Doug. I got to meet Brett one day. Mike, he's a 
good guy. And what about Mike D'Agostino? He's a good guy. He's a good guy. Have you ever met him? You know, uh, no, I haven't. I hear he is on the same uh, LPP dental plan. Okay. So the really good dental plan that we have. Uh, I hear he gets about the same paycheck as I do. So all things considered, is probably. Is he an LPP guy? Oh yeah, definitely. No I doubt. never heard of his. You can name meet him before. at Crucible. Okay. So let's talk about one where we could find your your amazing podcast. Two, what do you guys have in store? Do we have another gathering of eagles coming yes, up? Yes. Ah, ha, ha. So leadpursuit.net is the website. Uh, iTunes, I guess, probably. Pornhub. Any place you can listen. Pornhub, yep. Pornhub. The, uh, Pornhub lead pursuit sites. Really, really excellent. Uh, and our next gathering of eagles is going to be Orlando. Orlando. Orlando, Florida, Crucible, and it is... I believe September 29th to October 2nd in Orlando, Florida. Okay. Well, and you can find more information on, uh, how can they find you guys on Facebook? Uh, I think it's just Lead Pursuit Podcast on Facebook, Instagram. And uh, if not, I I think we've linked to you guys plenty of times. They'll find us. But once again, huge fan. And we're going to make sure he gets back to gaming and because we just lost Tommy. So anyway... Steve D'Agostino, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. See, I got both both names. Awesome. Well, we're back. And uh, this time we have Lauren Steed from Casemate Publishing with us. Now, Tom, one of the great things about our relationship with these guys is I've got to interview some really cool authors. Have you? You've done that too. I have. Um... I've interviewed the uh, people who wrote uh, Baker's Boys, the uh, the whole novel in the Korean War, which is a lot of personal first-hand accounts. They've got a lot of variety to their catalog, um, and so it's been a real treat to see what kind of authors they have and what kind of things they've got coming out. So, uh, Welcome, Lauren. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. So tell us a little bit about Casemate. Uh, you own the place, right? <laughs> She is the president of Casemate. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, don't let David know the actual CEO or owner. Uh, that. I have no idea who that is. <laughs> um, and you probably won't listen to this. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So, no, tell us all about Casemate. Perfect. So, um, Casemate Publishers is, is not only do we publish military history, uh, ranging anywhere from the ancient Civil War, World War II, up until the modern era, uh, we also do the distribution for a lot of different uh, publishers that you see. Um, that you other necessarily wouldn't see because they're mostly in the European markets. Right. So we do the modeling for Morton's and Tempest. We do Pen and Sword as one of our biggest distribution clients, which I'm sure your listeners know very much about. We know um, about Casemate, too. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask everybody out there. Um, we're going to take a five-minute break and go um, go check to see how many Casemate books you have. Okay? <laughs> All right. So while they're gone, we can keep going. Um because they can stop the podcast, we hope. So, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, and what I do at Casemate is I am personally responsible for marketing the books that are pre-World War One. So, it, basically everything up until the 20th century. Uh, which, All the way from Stone time, uh, Stone Age to... Yeah. And so... To industrial. Kind of an interesting... Qu- you know, I didn't pick this up when you were saying it before, but so it's broken down to 20th century, 21st century. Is there that many books where it's separated from everything from pre-World War I? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I do everything. Oh, uh, gosh. This would be Daniel, pretty much, is my coworker. Who he's does, not here. He's not here, but and he, he does. And he refuses to come on a podcast. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. yeah. What have I done? Uh, I'm blazing new grounds. So, no, there is definitely enough, like World War II especially, Korean, yeah. Vietnam, it, it just the Falklands. All of that pretty much falls under his purview, and it is a pretty even split between the, the sheer volume of books that gets produced. I can't tell you the sheer volume of your books I have in my house. And the thing <laughs> is, everybody that's out there, you should be back by now, because you, you have one of those, you have a Casemate book in your house, I, I guarantee it, or somebody they, 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 they distribute, and I, I find those books great, but interviewing the authors, I... I've right. gotten so much good feedback from that. I love it. Um, I find it interesting because you really get to talk to an expert. So, you know, yeah, I, I'll give it to him. And, you know, interesting and in asking them, like, you know, what motivated you to write this book? And I, 
I love doing it. I, I, I want to keep doing that with you guys. Uh, what do you think? That, well, you know, she did pay for lunch. Um, no, I, I love it. And you, you've posted a lot of options for us. We have a lot of writers that are looking to read these books. And so we're your audience, and we're happy to get it out to other people in the audience. Let me ask a question of you. Sure, sure. So the books you market are specifically for, um, like, pre-20th century, right? Yes. So what is the most unique book or books mm -hmm. that you've marketed or seen come across your desk in the last six months? Last six months. Good thing you put a timeline on it. I would say my favorite book right now is probably a Civil War book. It is on the biography of Strong Vincent. Oh, I'm um, doing that one, I told you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you hopped all over that. That's put out by Hans G. Myers. I have just really enjoyed reading it. It kind of makes uh, Strong Vincent come to life more on the page, sets the record right. And he had um, great facial hair. Right, yeah, yeah. It's um, And it's just, it's a heck of a story, and I've really appreciated that. It's He's also a Pennsylvania native coming out of Erie, so there's a nice local angle. So that's good for the Civil War. I think other ones, there's a current Simon Elliott title that's coming out that's about, um, I'm going to butcher their name, but he is the father of Constantius the Great. It's, it's the... Not so much his father, but the, the pirate king that kind of broke away from the Roman push uh, and just kind of held the Roman Britain Isle hostage from Rome and was a pirate king. And it's all about the breakdown of the battles and the conflicts that they had and kind of what led to this division in the ranks. Um, and that's a, that's a precursor that's coming out that I'm really excited to get my hands on. So, uh, you know, Daniel did tell us that you're yeah. a huge fan of uh, Ancients. That is my Tell forte. me what the draw is there. The draw? Um, there's really no good answer here. There isn't a good answer. No. I would say there's a lot of the myths and the legends that kind of bleed through that, that make these figures larger than life. And you could talk for hours about, you know, the archaeological record, what we know, what we don't know. And I think those ongoing discussions that has that distance of several thousand years. Right. I, I think that just makes it all the more compelling. And this has always been a passion. Yes. Yeah. From, from college onward, pretty much. Oh, I wish I had a passion that old. What about you? <laughs> what about I'm, you, I'm Tom? teaching this every day. So yeah, I teach yeah, this yeah. every day. So, like... Yeah. We did something like kind of not nice to her. We made her play um, Blood and Plunder, your first miniatures game in historicals. Yeah, it was fun. It was good. I like the. Uh, now she was, was a War 40k player. Warhammer 40k. Yep. Right. Fantasy. And what do you think of Blood and Plunder? If you didn't like it, it's fine. The designer's right over there. So. Well, well I, I don't think Tom uh, treated me too harshly <laughs> with this. I, I, I like the. He's there a was har the horrible cheat. <laughs> there was the pirate coin aspect that was really interesting to allow you to, you know, spend those to kind of increase your luck. Um, otherwise, usually I'm used to playing on a grid, too. So it was cool to break out the tape measure and maneuver the troops around in that way. Um, that was very interesting. I really like the setup and the terrain, too. Here's Sorry. a trick I question. I will briefly apologize, because if you hear me yelling or disappearing, it's because I, I'm partially running the Blood and Plunder tournament, which is going on behind us well, right now. Well, and we're probably going to well, take her around and uh, yeah. see all the interesting things. But, you know, crazy question. So now with your, your first taste of this experience, you are a gamer. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know how we knew she was a magic gamer? She was, like, tapping, and it was, like, it was so interesting. <laughs> And the way she shuffled the cards and fanning, I'm like... You want to treat them with respect. That's a magic play. Mine are all in plastic, so I don't get little baby cards yeah, shooting out a couple months later. Um, you, would you ever see yourself playing a historical war game? So, I, I can. I think it is a, a major kind of investment, and I do think there are barriers to Oh, kind we can of help you with that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, we're not going to get a no out of you here. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I um, I could get you the miniatures and even get somebody to paint them for you. Oh, hey. Yeah, yeah. yeah Mitch knows everybody. If you haven't gotten that impression yet. I, I, it doesn't mean they <laughs> like me. Generally. It, it, most of them don't like me. They figured it's, yeah. it's, I leave faster if they're nice, which is kind of true. I'm, I'm more than uh, capable of just jumping into learning the different mechanics and things from games. And I think what kind of sets historical, aside from fantasy and sci-fi, not to say it's better or worse, is that historical has that precedent that you can you right. may not know about the period, or you, I don't know much about pre-colonial era, or um, so. If I don't know like much that, about the period, 
Huh. How can I learn about it? You you could learn about it. <laughs> How can by, I learn about it? Uh, is there a website I can go to to gosh, learn about it? It's almost as if like there's publishers that focus on these things. Uh, you could check us out at casematepublishers.com uh, and, and browse by your favorite subject history there and kind of learn more about the period that you're interested in launching from those games. Oh, yeah. Which I think is just not the same kind of thing you get in fantasy and sci-fi. No, so, no, definitely no. not. And I know, you know, we have some fantasy writers on staff here. True. I yeah. don't I don't kind of read a lot of that stuff. But I did read that Tracy Flick book, but this is not book club. But, um, you know, first of all, we want to thank you guys oh, for, for allowing us to do that and, and, you know, meeting all of the folks from Casemate, well, you and Daniel especially, and I know our readers like it, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll tell you what, like, getting to know some of these authors, uh, to me, has been so rewarding, Tom. Um, I am excited about this uh, Strong Vincent book, because I do want to know more about him, and then maybe I'll paint some Civil War miniatures. Ooh. Who knows? <laughs> Tommy? I, I think she's got some, she's got some Taurus you got to give her, because uh, there's some Civil War games upstairs. Oh, we saw them already. Enormous. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. They're crazy. Yeah, the Battle of Antietam was one of the the dioramas. Yes, that was with being set um, up. Uh, the two Johns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great guys. Nice. And if you notice that passion to detail, yes, and the research is there. And like I was waiting for you to ask, how do you research this? We we were going into to. I saw it was getting a little, you know, yeah. you know, there was that uh, personal, uh, you know, you were about to spring that big question, but go hit case made publishing. Um, once again, we're fans and expect way more interviews. Uh, even with Lauren, we'll probably have you back on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, we'll probably it's back go on. Viral. Yeah. Um, you, you're not the first woman on the No Dice No Pori podcast, but um, you're in the, the top six. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. It's just not our demographic. Trailblazing. Yeah, you're trailblazing. But yeah, uh, we're huh. going to wrap up the the uh, Blood and Plunder tournament here and uh, we'll be back with another interesting person to talk to probably not as interesting as Lauren uh, but we're going to try well thank you for having me welcome hey well we're back once again live from Historicon and you know one of the great things about Historicon it's not so much what you play it's sometimes who you meet and uh, yesterday, no, actually it was two days ago. I two feel days like I've known you yeah. forever. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, here's the other crazy thing. You're friends with people on Facebook, and you never really meet them. Historicon is the opportunity to meet people in real life. So, ladies and gentlemen, Lee Gaddis from Gaddis Games. Yeah. How you doing? I cannot complain. I'm here with my tribe. It's all gamers. A tribe it, called Quest? A tribe called Quest. No, yeah. it's a tribe called Historicon. And just the variety and depth and breadth of the gaming community here is absolutely fascinating. It is. It is. And, you know, we said if it exists in real life, there's, there's a game about Somebody's it. gaming it. Yeah. So the first question we're going to ask is, let me hear your, your gaming background. What are you, your gaming creds? Okay. Well, I started gaming officially when I was eight, and that was with D&D. Uh-oh. Uh, and then from that... Uh, occupied a lot of my weekends until a girl took uh, interest in me at 14. I was about to say <laughs> at uh, 33. At no, 33, yeah. And uh, and my my miniatures gaming started happening with Ogre. Ogre was like because it was a pocket game and oh, something yeah. we could take to school and I play for lunchtime. It. Yeah. So it was the pocket edition of Ogre. Started my miniatures gaming and those were metal. Uh, the, the pewter miniatures. I remember those back in the day. Yeah, and then um, and then we, uh, you know, I, I can't remember what the rule set was, but there was a hobby shop near my house where we bought models. Me and my dad, we would build World War II 148 scale model airplanes. Wow. We would buy them on a Saturday, then we had a Thursday night build night, and we would put them together. And that got me, I was used to it. And then when we started playing D&D, I was the one that was painting everybody's Citadel uh, miniatures for him because I had the paint from the scale model uh, building. So I became the, the guy to come to for paint because I had the paints and the brushes. And that was when you were putting on Tester's paint like it was eye, I eye, eyeliner. Yeah. I remember. Thick, as, thick coats, no that's, primer. That's why I stayed a board gamer for such a long time. But, uh, you know, it's somewhere in the early 2000s. Yeah. I might as well start this thing because it, it's, it's, like you said, it's, it's a cool tribe here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's um and and as a hobby, you know, of course, you know, there was the teenage dating and you couldn't be, you know, I didn't I couldn't have my 
my cool friends meet my nerd friends. You know, so I had those it's two. It's so hard. Yeah, I had those two it's roles. Like Superman, Clark Kent. Clark Kent, exactly. Which one was Superman in your opinion? Was it, it your it was normal the community. or your, ga- your gaming community? <laughs> the gaming right, because you have superpowers Cause I, there. Yeah, because I was pretending to be Clark Kent. You I were was pretending. really. Yeah, well, it, I you've was embraced really your inner self, man. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I knew that the future belonged to the nerds. I mean, I, you know, that that was just an early realization to me. In order to get through society with the least amount of friction, you had to pretend to be Clark Kent. Yeah, right. And so I knew all of my friends that were like super smart and were doing math and computers, the, the Commodore Amiga 2000, all kind, they were all my nerd friends. It, it wasn't my, my regular I so r- rarely interview somebody my own age. No. Yeah. So all the references I get, I will put footnotes at the bottom if anybody doesn't get any of that. Okay. We, we get younger people. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sometimes. No problem. Yeah. And, you know, um, so, for, so for me, uh, growing up in, in that culture and being a part of it, it was just second nature, and also I was at the age where music changed, right? Yeah. Where we went from you know uh, to from rock and roll to the new wave movement, and that you know fully embracing that whole punk aesthetic, uh, you know that was part of it too, and being able to play out a lot of social uh, situations through D and D without having to go out in the real world and experience it, I think prepared me a lot better to deal with people and learning how to work cooperatively allowed me to broaden my, my, my social group. So gaming brought a lot of social benefits to me that weren't immediate to me at the time when I was growing growing up. You know, And we're definitely going to get to, hopefully in a minute, how you've passed that on, which I, I found, out of all the things we talked about yesterday, mm-hmm. one, one of near and dear to my heart because, you know, it's... There's so many benefits from gaming that you see. That aren't apparent right away. They're not apparent. So I was just taking around. She was actually just previously on the podcast, um, uh, Lauren from Casemate. And yeah. we were just going around talking and I'm saying, you know, you got to be a little voyeuristic. You see how people make decisions in games is how mm-hmm. they make decisions everywhere else. And you can see who the alpha is, who's rising to the top. I think it's, I am a huge fan of uh, experiential gaming. I'm a huge fan mm-hmm. of educational gaming. It's all fun stuff. But this gaming passion somehow turned into Gaddis Games. Yeah. How'd that happen? Yeah, so what happened was simply this. There was, um, throughout my gaming life, I played every white-haired wizard, I played every blue-haired elf, I played every red-haired dwarf. But what I didn't get a chance to play was something that was culturally relevant to me. Right. And so I've been wargaming for a while, Bolt Action got really big, you know, I had all the armies. And then I realized that the 100th anniversary of World War I was coming up, and I was using gaming as a teaching tool in my after-school program. And it was, it was, it was an all-African-American class of, of kids, and, um, and I wanted to celebrate that 100th anniversary of World War I, and they did a report about the most decorated unit of World War I, which are the Harlem Hellfighters. Hell, 369th New York. Yeah. So... So they did the report, and so we created a game so that they could play out one of the battles uh, that the Harlem Hellfighters were involved in. And I realized I couldn't get miniatures. There was no Harlem Hellfighters miniatures. Oh, I can tell you where to get them. Yeah. So, <laughs> so now, so we made that, dedicated the game to the Harlem Hellfighters. De- uh, we dedicated the miniatures line to them for World War One, and uh, and so that launched the our our game empire. Right, and then after that, is I was, it an evil empire they, or a benevolent empire? It's a benevolent empire for the benefit of all gamers to collect miniatures and paint them. Oh wow! Yeah, did you rehearse that? Yeah, it, so, sounds, it sounds canned, but I love it. I got a tingle. Yeah, and if you didn't <laughs> check your pulse. Yeah, and so uh, what happened was in the in the interim, I was at a Thanksgiving dinner and we were watching Battle of the Bulge. My grandfather who was ninety. Henry Fonda. Yeah. Yeah, Battle of the Bulge, and uh, and my grandfather, who was 94 at the time, said, those are the wrong tanks. And I said, how do you know, Grandpa? And my great uncle said, because who fought in Korea, he said, because he was there. And literally, the, you know, milk out my nose, and I was like, what? I'm like, what do you mean he was at Battle of the Bulge? He goes, yeah, he was, you know, 700 years tank battalion. I was, you, I'm like, how come I don't know this? How come this is, how can I live for 40 years you and never not asked. know? You never asked. I never asked. And they never talked about it. It's something right. they didn't talk about. Yeah. So the people who had served in my family knew and they talked about it because they were all veterans. Right. But those of us who weren't veterans, 
you know, they, it's just not something that was brought up at mealtime. Not polite conversation. Yeah, not polite conversation to have, right? And so I dedicated my second game, Empire Falls, World War II, to the members of the 7th, 161st Tank Battalion and dedicated it to my grandfather who has since passed away. And so that was the second game we released using that same guards system. You know, you bring up uh, the Harlem Hellfighters and mm -hmm. I've, I love Great War and yeah. I've, I've written them into two games I worked on, mm -hmm. but they're a French unit and I always get the, well, why? I said, well, there's an interesting story if you <laughs> care to hear it. And um, they're like, no, but they were U.S. troops. I go, Correct. Yeah, it's, it's U.S. troops that the U.S. didn't want, and the French were happy to have them, and they were a very decorated unit, and it is one of the they most... They were the most decorated, decorated unit. unit. Of, yeah. And it is such a remarkable story. It is, you and know... why there hasn't been a Hollywood eight-part miniseries built on them... Well, I know why America, but you there know, you go. It, 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 it should be done. And there's so many untold stories beyond Band of Brothers, beyond Saving Private Ryan, that would be excellent uh, uh, pr primers for history as jumping off points to the fact that we fought two world wars with segregated armies. Remember, the military in the United States didn't become desegregated until 1947 under Truman. And it wasn't even fully desegregated. When we started Korea, we still had segregated, segregated units. units. Right, yeah, until Vietnam, right? Yeah. 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 So so when we talk about American history, we have to we have to talk about the fullness of it and why things are the way they are, because otherwise it won't make sense. Right. If you don't understand that legacy and the links in that chain, what's happening today will only confuse you. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Which is hey, everybody, this is why you need to come to cons, because we've been we're just rehashing conversations we had over the last sure, few days. Sure, and there are real people who teach. There are real historians here, people who have who have scholarship and, and, and academia in this subject. And if I had had the the knowledge of history that I got, the training that I got in history in college, if I had had that in high school, it would have been a whole nother situation and way more interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. the real history of America is way more fascinating and way more interesting and way more absorbing. Than the than the propaganda that you get going matriculating through, through I one hundred percent agree and through grade school you bring up an interesting point so you know about how there's not a lot about this out there and it, I'll tell you what you want a movie I love a movie how about a how about a good book because doing the research for the Harlem Hellfighters mm -hmm. there was the one book that was written really as a graphic novel as a graphic novel yeah which I have by uh, uh, Max Brooks Mel Max, Brooks son yeah yep yeah, and. Uh, it tells the story. Yeah. Um, there was a couple of others, but it looked at, you know, our society, and, yeah. and they they Unpacked have it, one yeah. of one element of it. And I think there's only two documentaries that were made about it, and that was for right. the anniversary of World War One. Never seen a, a full book about them. No. And they had so many interesting people. I mean, because you know, we talk about oh, the, the introduction of jazz to Europe was through the Harlem Hellfighters, through the band, Lieutenant Europe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, people. I mean, again, the history. If you if you're willing to take some time to research it, you will be greatly rewarded. Right. You will be greatly rewarded. The, the contributions that were made by African Americans um, during wartime um, is, are are you know are are absolutely riveting and fascinating, and the heroism and the valor that was portrayed in the heat of battle for you know. For, for a country that did not reciprocate that same love that they right. showed for the country, I think that 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 you want a Romeo and Juliet story. There you go. Yeah, it, you know it's a compelling story and one that you know sadly sometimes TV makes light of that. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen both Tuskegee Airmen movies. Mm -hmm. um, I've also met real Tuskegee Airmen and had very you know interesting conversations. Yeah, with those them. movies do not do in the stories justice at all. No, and they and they they really don't. And it's them explaining like um, you know because they're saying, oh, you know, you served in the Air Force, college boy. You know, we were the only unit that was all college educated. Yeah, in the entire you know Chuck Yeager. No, no, <laughs> no, not at all. And uh, everybody talks about him. And you know it's. It's part of our story. You know, we, we, we like to think that we're a nation of inclusion. You know, uh, we're the melting the pot. Myth. The it, myth. It, it, it really the myth of America It really turns out to be because if, if it wasn't, you know, if we really embraced it, these stories would be common knowledge. Yeah. And realize, you know, we, we hold Chuck Yeager up as like the top guy of pilots, but... There was a woman pilot that, that beat him in a dogfight. Jackie Cochran. Yeah, that was that was the trainer. She was the trainer of the fighter pilots that were fighting in World War II. First woman to go supersonic. Right? Not talked about. 
<laughs> you know? I'm really good at trivia. That's yeah, how I know yeah. this stuff. Uh, Don't play him in Trivial Pursuit. That's yeah, all I can say. Yeah, Strip Trivial Pursuit yeah. is definitely not a good idea with me. But, you know, and gaming is, I think, a great tool to bring that history alive. Sure. Yes. And, you know, you, 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 you take the sociological elements out of it. it yeah. It's a great way to teach. You found a very unique way to teach history and give it pertinency to students. And I, big right. fan, so, I, want, I want you to tell everybody about this. Sure. So, what I, this is the, the, so we had an after-school program for kids uh, in Detroit. Uh, and what I did was I created a program on veterans. It started with a Veterans Day program where everybody in the class had to go and talk to one of their relatives about who served in their families. So that became a cross-generational conversation with kids, with their parents, kids with their grandparents, and sometimes kids with their great-grandparents, their right. great-uncles, stuff like that, anybody that was still alive. And so one kid came in, and he wrote a report, and he said, these are the people that serve. He said, I had a, uh, my great-great-great-grandfather served in Buffalo Soldiers. I had a great-uncle that served in World War I. I had a uh, great-grandfather that served in World War II. I had uh, my grandfather served in Vietnam. My dad served in Desert Storm. Right. So this guy had five generations of military in his family going all the way back, you know, to, to right after Reconstruction. 9th and 10th Cavalry. Yeah, yeah. Which, good trivia question, who actually captured Sam on Hill? It was... The Buffalo Soldiers. soldiers. Yeah. yeah. But... Left Teddy, out of the history books, right? Yeah. yeah. Teddy which, Roosevelt. Is, which is a reoccurring theme in American history. Yeah. You ever <laughs> notice that? I, I, I kind of wonder why that yeah, those is. those guys were there, but we're not going to talk about them. Yeah. They'll pay yeah. attention to those and, guys. And it's, you know, you hear they have the... These got one unit was all volunteers. Yeah. Very unmilitary. Yeah. And the newspapers loved them. Yeah. Uh, the guys that were probably one of the better units was the 9th and 10th that went over there. Yeah. Got dehorsed and. Um, they were already trained. They were already trained. And, and history is yeah, not very much yeah. about it, too. Which, uh, So, you know, for, yeah. for um, Blood and Steel, I yeah. am, I'm doing Span Am. Yeah. And it's going to be the 9th and 10th. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah, so so part of that was them was having a cross generation to let kids know that they're a link in a chain that goes back and make history relevant. And so for an English assignment, writing the report was their English credit. They got a history credit for doing the research, and then the reward for doing those two things was playing the game. So the game became the Friday re reward. So what I had to do was we had to be able to come up with a game that you could teach in 15 minutes and play in an hour and a half, and that became the guards' rule system. So with that rule system... Which he has right here. Yeah. So that, that rule system became the, um, uh, the catalyst for making games in each genre. So if you learn that base rule system, then you can play World War I, you can play World War you can theme it for whatever era. And right now we're working on Revolutionary War, American Civil War, and we're eventually going to do ancients using that guard system so for us it's a way so you can go into a classroom whatever period of history they're teaching you can reward the kids with a game and then give them prize support in the form of the miniatures and the games and the tokens everything that goes with it what's the reception been with the students and, and even more so the students parents uh towards this so in in detroit having that ha the parents were really happy to get their kids off of the computer games oh yeah right oh, yeah. and some of the benefits that we didn't realize at the time is that it improved the kids' analytical thinking skills by 60%, right? No because kidding, they had huh? to take these <laughs> Because it was a chess model, right? You take these resources to achieve a goal. Right. Uh, teaching kids communication skills by having to work together to achieve a goal, by having them uh, working face-to-face -face communication, um, being able to, to, to be involved in, in, in something that they felt interested in, so the parents uh, and grandparents who were then communicating with those kids and explaining to them, I lived through this, this is what happened in our lives, made the kids feel more involved in their communities and made them feel that they had more stake in their communities, right? And so those were tertiary effects right. of what we were doing through gaming. And no pushback from school boards, from parents, well, when we tried to do it... I after, mean, a little rain has to fall every once in a while. Yeah. So after we tried to do it in 2019, uh, we had new elections, of course, new school boards got put in place, and then we talked about, well, the game included the Harlem Hellfighters, not that much pulled back, but when we started talking about the 1st Tank Battalion, the original Black Panthers, then it became CRT. Oh, really? 
Yeah, I don't know how you make that logical I, I leap. But yeah. It well, actually was the nickname of the unit, and it's in their unit crest. Yeah. Huh. And the really weird thing is, is that people who are on these school boards don't know history, and they were associating the Black Panthers with the Black Panthers of the 1960s. Which, you know, there's 20 years separation between them. At least. And uh, one was fighting in World War Two. the other was a... Uh, social political movement. So people not knowing that history, being in charge of educating your children, I think is a problem in and of itself, and we should vet people on our school boards more. But not wanting to teach the real history of America is really creating a deficit in our education system where you have one group of people knowing the real history with facts right. and another group of people believing a myth. You know, it, it's... We're going to totally veer off gaming, everybody, but it's fine. You know, it's interesting... But you, gaming is a tool that you use to teach real history. Right. And, you know, here's the thing that I'm not getting, you know, trying to expand upon your point. Mm -hmm. By having them ignore it, we don't know what's going to end up happening because they'll, they'll live their lives ignoring it. But mm -hmm. teaching it and having them deal with it. I, like, you know, what do, what do you want? You want me to lie to you? You want me to tell you the truth? Right. It, it's what are we doing here? What kind of example we're setting? What kind of a society are we trying to build? You know, if you want to talk about Orwellian 1984, you know, that's what that's what you're creating. And and George Orwell's book was not a how-to manual. It was a warning. It was a warning. <laughs> it was a yeah. warning. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and you know, like you said, gaming. It's we could go on forever yeah. about what what gaming really. It, it's you know about human interaction, personal interaction. And I think you you and I were talking like you know board gaming. I could do it silent. Sure. Miniatures gaming, and especially like seeing how you do team level games where there's four people on each sure. side and how they interact. And you got to interact with your opponent because, you know, it's the, oh, the WYSIWYG. Do I need, sure. Is this guy here? You know, it's, it's giving you some critical skills, which, you know, I try to get my son to play these. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's not Roblox. It's not no. this. It's not no, that. It's, and it's a totally different. You're using a totally different part of your brain, right? And also, when you're at a table with somebody and you're face to face, there's no rage quitting, right? We have. Oh, me, I've been to a lot of historic cons there, sir. No, me and you, <laughs> me and you have entered into a social contract. We have, right? I it's, hope I live up to it. It's a social contract that me and you are across the table. We're going to play until the last dice is rolled, right? right? So, to be a Gaddis gamer. The Gaddis Gaming community, the social contract that we establish is that at the end of the game, win, lose, or draw, we shake hands. Right. Right? I can't do that in a video game. Nor would I want to. Some of those people don't shower yeah, very much. Yeah. You know, well, you and I 100% agree. Yeah. And, and we lose the ability to communicate with one another. Yeah. And that, to me, is it, there's nothing good coming from that. And some of the students have said some of the best games they had, they've lost. But it was a fun game to them. Oh, yeah. Because the objective is, because what they realize is that it's not about winning or losing. It's about spending time with your fellow students. Right. And that's what video games and stuff, a generation of people being raised on video games, they've lost that, they've lost that simple human ability. And they realize we have a million years of hardwiring as human beings to be social animals. Right. And you're going to take one generation and then remove them from that, and you wonder why they're dysfunctional. So I think for... <laughs> so I am not disagreeing with you. Yeah, whatsoever. so I think for us, gaming also brings that type of aspect to it, that it, that it reconnects us to the basic core being of what it is to be human, and that's to be in concert with other human beings, right? Male, female, it doesn't matter. You are with another person and you're across the table from them, and you're sharing that experience, right? This goes back, I, I even go back further, to, to cavemen sitting around a fire telling a story. And by the way, Leah's very shy. Yeah, <laughs> sitting around a cave, campfire telling a story, right? You come home from the hunt, you tell the story around the campfire after you, you've, you've eaten the brontosaurus burger, right? That's Flintstone, and, sir. Yeah, and, <laughs> so, and so what we're looking at is gaming is that, for the 21st century. You are telling a story narratively through figures with miniatures on the table. D&D &D is more theater of the mind and more abstract. Miniatures gaming is, is a narrative story with, mm -hmm. with, with, with a through, with, with a throughput of, you know, whether you're paying round one, round two, round three, um, it's multifaceted. You have an objective that you have to achieve by a certain amount of time, right? So, so 
it, 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 it's, it's an abstraction of that same type of campfire it story. A, it's an amazing framework to yeah. do a lot of other things. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. Looking at this year's historic con, let's be honest, it's kind of light for a Friday here. You've been to these things before. Yeah, yeah. What are three things that need to change within the gaming community? Mm -hmm. Any three things that you think that it would bring about a better experience? Um, well, or the one thing that I would do <laughs> That would be a positive thing that we try to do as Gaddis Gamers is that we try to be ambassadors to the hobby, right? Very good. So we have yes. to think about the whole hobby. We have to think about collecting your miniatures, uh, painting your miniatures, and then coming out and participating, whether it's at a, at some, at, at a game store or at a, at a convention, right? Right. And I would... Oh, I would make sure there's an on-ramp for every community. When I look at Mythos Gaming, where they're making an on-ramp for, for the Native American community. Oh, look at that. Yeah, we'll talk about it in a minute. Yeah. I promise. Hey. So, so making sure that we have uh, places for everybody to land at, right? Because when I got started, it was all looking at it through a medieval European lens. Right. And that was because Lord of the Rings was really big at the time, mm -hmm. right? So it, so now, we, now if we can look at it through... If you want to get into the gaming, if you're a woman, here here's a game that you could get in. You can play an all-female Soviet army if you want to do bolt action, because that really existed. That's a historical fact. Their top three snipers, female. Their top tank commander with tank ace, female. Right. So you, if you're a woman, there's your on ramp to get in. A couple of really good pilots too, I heard. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to play Wings of Glory, World War II, there you go. You can do the female pilot. Uh, uh, check your six. So every genre. There should be a place for somebody to get in through their natural cultural lens and not have it forced. I, I was hoping you would lead off with that because I think that is so important. And, you know, when I said we have to include the Harlem Hellfighters in mm -hmm. these two games and we have to make them French because it's, people are going to ask the question. They, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, well, you know, maybe it's a touchy subject. And I'm like, I don't care. No, and again, not a why should it be? For me. Not why should one it for be? Me. Why, why is it? You know, nobody should be insecure because these people were fighting for us, right? And I mean, all of us—they weren't just fighting for one group of people, right? <laughs> you know, and and why? And and, and what, the question I ask a lot—not to necessarily kids, but to adults—why do you side yourself with the oppressor and not with the oppressed? Why do you why do you know that your ancestors weren't abolitionists and and you know how how do you know that you were automatically on the side of the slaveholders not the people that were fighting to free people I mean why would you identify in this day and age with that when there's so few people that actually own slaves right why 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 would you why would you not embrace the fact that if you want to have one America like you say you want to have, right. why not embrace the people that did the heavy lifting? So, Literally it, did the heavy lifting. Literally. So inclusivity. And, yeah. I, and I think that's a problem, I think, in especially in historical gaming. Yeah. That if you look at the Euro gaming, the, the family, well, they call it family gaming, but, you know, families should never game together. They'll kill each other. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, they've embraced the inclusivity. Yeah, and um, like I know from my work in Zenobia, mm. I thought it was amazing to get those voices into the gaming space. Sure. And what I was so upset about was the reaction that you know. And I even said in one of the podcasts we did an interview, like, "Hey, you know," because the reaction was so severe. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, white guys, um, they're not going to take your dice away. Women and these people are not taking your dice away. But it wouldn't it be better? And then I get the well. You know, just because somebody's a woman, how it, it is, this framed the problem sure. for me? How would they know the Napoleonic capture, you know, Battle of Moscow better than a man? Then you're not getting the point. The point is from their everybody point, can read a history book, right? Anybody can do that, but <laughs> but the games that they put out represented them, the cultures they identify with yeah. in history, yeah. And they were amazing games that I thought was a big success. For that project, sure, and um, it was just interesting because when we sat down with the finalists, yeah, it was like Native American did a game. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 I forgot the name, right? But it was interesting. It was about his folklore, mm -hmm. and it was an interesting story. I learned something from that. Um, Molly House, uh, 
you know, about the homosexual community in London, you know, at the time of, I think it was just before the U.S. Revolution. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And it's like, they're not doing a game on the on the invasion of Russia, guys, it, yeah. it, or people. They're, they're doing it from a different lens. And the more that you can, you know, if you want to say, oh, games, you learn a lot. Well, then Here, try to yeah. learn something from try a game. Try to learn something new, right? Right, yeah. learn something new. Yeah. Because, got to be honest with you, there's you a know, lot out there. You know, it was a, 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 one of the eye-opening experiences to me that I engaged in was a game called Congo came out. And it was about... Oh, I know all about this. Right? Yeah. yeah. So colonists coming in, and, and so it was through that lens. And they were like, you know, do we really need that type of game at this time? Well, that game was pulled. Well, so I flipped it on its head. I said, well, can I play uh, a Congolese uh, going after the colonists in order to wipe them out and push them out of my lands? And the guy was like, well, yeah, I guess you could. I never really thought about that. I'm Set like, her up. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, I'm in. If, yeah. I, if I can play the opposite, if I can play the people fighting against colonization yeah. instead of the, the colonists, then I'm all for it. That way you have a balanced game, right? That way Congo doesn't have to be just from a European colonialist lens, right? So so having me in the room allowed that question to be asked and allowed the designers to think of it in a different way, right? So having people of different opinions and different backgrounds and different experiences in a room makes the game richer. It doesn't take anything away. It takes nothing away. Part of away. being a Gaddis gamer is not taking away chairs from the table. It's making the table bigger for everybody. So you keep branding this Gaddis gamer. Yeah. What, what is a Gaddis gamer? A Gaddis gamer is, is a hobby ambassador. So whatever game you're playing... You are playing it to make people feel welcome and to bring more people into the hobby. That is the whole point of being a Gaddis gamer. I, I I would like to one day be a Gaddis gamer. Thank you. I, I don't. I, it sounds like a very high bar here, and yeah. I'll even talk you out well, of it. And, and there's different flavors. So we have Gaddis gamers. Uh, there's also if you go a little bit west to Wisconsin, you have ta- you have minions for the tabletop minions, mm-hmm. right? You have those guys. So th- it's all about being brand ambassadors to the miniatures gaming hobby. I can't tell you how important that is. And I know folks that I said, go to this store. They play, you know, X game every Saturday. Mm-hmm. And they were like, not very welcoming. And I don't, I don't even want to play the game now as much sure. as I was interested in the subject matter. Sure, I've been in stores where I wasn't welcome. I, yeah. I know when as soon as I walk in and I ask, the, and they ignore me. You know, they turn their back on you, and I'm like, well, obviously my do- my money's green everywhere I go, and if it's not green here, then it, I'll go somewhere else. It's not because you, they do it to me, too. Yeah. Like, oh, this guy's totally going to steal something. Yeah, some guys yeah. are just like that, yeah. and and those aren't the people that we want to associate with. We want to have a gaming community that's welcome, because to me, more people at the table means more people I can play with. More people I can play with means more games I can play. The more games I can play, the more fun I can have. The more fun I can have, the better my life is. I uh, So I was invited, because I know we're getting far afield, and I want you to plug your stuff. Um, <laughs> I was invited to go to a um, board gaming tournament. I'm not going to say the game. And we interviewed the guys that are producing the game now. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, we're talking. I always talk, well, what about the future? And he goes, well, he asked me after the podcast, what do you think? I go, you know what I think? I think in 20 years, almost everybody in this room is going to be dead. And no one's going to play this game anymore. Right. And that to me would be a tragedy. Mm-hmm. But I, what can you do about that now? And then I guess the, the answer was, well, we'll be gone too, so we don't care. It doesn't that, matter, yeah. It, it's... That's not the Bad good attitude. answer. That's Bad not. Attitude, but yeah. what are you what are you going to do? Because you have a passion and energy, and you're directing it in the right way, in a positive way. In a positive way. Yeah. And and there's so many people online that are looking to be offended, whether you're on the left or the right. And what we're trying to say is is that there's room at the table for everybody. Nobody is diminished by this. Yes. Oh, I agree. No. I, I, if you have more people in the store buying games, guess what? Your store gets bigger and it stays open. Right? If you have more people buying miniatures and playing games, that means more businesses stay open. Right. Oh, you know? yeah. So, so it, it's a net positive. When you come in, you say, well, only white, blue eyed, blonde haired males should be able to play this game, then you're, you're making the world smaller and you're, and you're cutting out the majority of people. I don't have blonde hair. Or blue eyes. Right. So, you know. And those people scare me, to be honest with you. I, I start getting that, um, you know, Homelander from uh, The Boys. Homelander, boy. yeah, from The Boys. Is, is that guy scary or what? Yeah, yeah. It's, so, uh, it's, it's amazing that so many people finally found out that he was the villain in the story. I didn't, I, I don't know oh, why I, that wasn't obvious. Episode from day one, one yeah. I knew. I just knew. I, because 
I know people like that. Yeah. And usually it's the pretty boys, the pretty guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and all the self doubt he has, I go, oh man. Yeah. That's why I was never a good looking man. Yeah. So so what we want to do, what we want to do for our generation, right, is not do what the previous generation did. We mm-hmm. don't want to make people feel belittled by playing. We want them to make them feel comfortable and empowered by playing. I agree. All right. And we want to expand the repertoire of games that we play and we want to make sure that that we have um, the points in history where other people can plug in from other cultures because it wasn't just one group of people that did everything, right? Um, and when I and when I look at how the gaming community is is fleshing, I mean, again, nobody's going to get the allegory for uh, Warhammer Forty Thousand, which is the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room, you know. But they set the market trend because they're a two billion dollar company, yep. right? So, uh, so when you look at the lore of Forty K. It's 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 fascist fighting demons, right? There's no good guys in 40k, unless you count the time. Oh, I heard a guy named Nelson explain that there's no bad side. There's and no, there's I, no and, good guys in 40k. And right, and in his game, there really is no bad guys. And I I think you, Nelson. I'll even go with Mike and Firelock. I, I think it's bringing a new flavor to the game. Yeah. I think it's expanding the game that we probably aren't seeing yet, but we will. I think we will see we're, it We're, as we're it at the grows. tip of that spear. We're at the, we're tip. the tip of that spear. Because you, you have a new generation of people, um, and Lockdown helped out a lot. A lot of people got into board. So a lot of people got into board gaming, exploded. Our miniatures uh, increased by 39% of our sales because people are buying online, people are getting into the hobby. And I think, again, just like... D and D was outlawed in the '80s and poo-pooed. I think miniatures gaming is at that point now. Yeah. We're, we're at the '80s of miniatures gaming, where it, uh. it, it's gaining acceptance. You have you wait for that generation to grow up and become, you know, monetarily stable, and then it's just going to explode like crazy. But it's it, it, it's a full hobby that everybody can participate in. You don't have to be big. You don't have to be tall. You don't have to be strong. You know, to play miniatures gaming. The, we the, had an 11 year old that yeah. played today. Oh, one of the X-wing champions was a freaking eight-year-old girl. Yeah, you know. So, so what you're looking at is 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 the is the miniatures gaming levels that tabletop. Where if you're if you're in sports, you have to have a certain physicality to be able to do it. But here, it doesn't matter what your muscle mass is. It doesn't nope. matter what how fast you run. You know, um, you know. And if you're just here to have fun and you're not here, you know, if you're not playing, I mean, there's, if you want to play competitively, nobody's going to stop you. Be a competitive player. But realize there's a lot of people that just roll the dice just to have fun, and they're just as welcome at the table just as anybody else. You can bring a fluffy army of, of pink kittens and have just a great time. I heard those you, are really OP. Yeah. That's what I heard. Way overpowered pink cat. cat the, the cat girls from Mars are way OP. I guarantee it. But, you know, but there's, there's a place for you. You know, there's a place for you, and there's a place for people who are creative. Uh, there's a place for people who are socially awkward. Um, there's a place for people who are who are uh, disabled. You know, um, and 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 we and we want to make sure that all those people feel welcome, and that's part of what is being a hobby hero, a Gaddis gamer. Uh, you know, all all of that. Because it says on this name tag, I looked a second ago, it's Hero by Design Studios. Yeah, which is the name of your studios. Yeah, and you know, first of all. You and I were in charge. We'd have this all figured out. It, it's simple. We got to make it happen. It's Everything so you easy. needed to know, you learned in kindergarten. Say please, thank you, and share your toys. That's and it. This is the sharing your toys part. And raise your hand to go to the bathroom. Yeah. I never got that one. I went to New York City Public <laughs> Education. But if you have to go, go. Don't pee in the chair. Oh, oof. New York City <laughs> Public Education. How can they find you? So we're at Gaddis Gaming. G a d d i s g a m i n g gaddisgaming dot com. Uh, we come out with new stuff every two or three months. We're a small company. We're you know our studio produces what we can on the budget that we have. Uh, and like I said. Um, uh, we just finished up our Chrysalum Kickstarter, which is 15 millimeter sci-fi. Uh, we released our World War One game in 2018. We released our World War Two game in 2020. Uh, so come by if you're into World War One, World War Two. You need miniatures. Uh, we do custom army lists all the time. And if you're just getting into the game, we'd love to have you and help you any way we can with miniatures gaming. All right, talk about the tabletop because I uh, we have a patented wanted- product from 2014, which was our Gaddis Gaming Table Topper, and it mainly sells it to game stores, but it takes any surface and turns it into a 4x6 or 4x4 gaming surface 
for little or no money down. I don't need a bed in my bedroom. I would rather have that. Yeah. I mean, we've had people play on milk crates. So, you know, in, in any anywhere you want a game, it could do it. It collapses down into a, a four foot by two and a half foot by nine inch thick mass that you can shove under your bed. You can hide Just it in a closet, put it in the like garage. squeeze it. Squat, touch it. Yeah. People like, like the tactile feeling of they, it. Yeah. They really do. It's yeah. like, you know, the uh, soothing blankets. Yeah. I, it, still, I still have one. It, 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 beca- it becomes a... a a touchstone and becomes a comfort item for gamers who may have um, who may have uh, what is that? Uh, not Munchausen. They have um, Asperger's. Asperger syndrome, right? Yeah, and they need to touch something. It, it becomes that, but it, it's durable enough, and people like it. And I'm glad that the, the people like it, and I'm, I'm glad it serves a purpose and a function uh, for people who don't have the time or tools to make these giant gaming tables. That it gives them a, a standard regulation size gaming table. Uh, for little or no money down. Yeah. Because our next I, nearest competitor, I think their table's like $2,000 for a gaming table, and that's I'll, a piece of furniture. I'll take four. But, uh, hey, Lee, thank you. No, oh, thank you and for having uh, me. I am glad I finally met you, and we're going to talk, because we're going to get this whole figured out. Yeah, we're um, going to work it out. Because there's a lot going on out there. But uh, thanks a lot. And, you know, it's every con, my last con, I spent a lot of it talking to Nelson. Mm-hmm. He's a friend now, and he's already asking me for favors. So please count, call on us here at No Dice, No Glory. Yeah. Anytime you want to come and talk or you want to push something, you got something new. New products coming out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely come and talk open to door. Us. You heard it here first, folks. You heard it. <laughs> yeah, I, and I do come through with my promises. Yeah. So how can we help support you? You got a Patreon or anything going on? No, you're a, no we're, we're good. We're mm-hmm. uh, privately funded. Okay, good. And good. that's how we could maintain our objectivity. Right, right. And uh, once somebody becomes cheap, then I guess we're going to have to do that. But no, we're... <laughs> We're here. We're all about getting excitement into this community and growing the community. And it's important. It's important. And, and I think that I, that having outreach and doing, like, event, we have to go to where the people are. Yeah. That's another thing I would like to do. Uh, you know, people can come to us at historic cons and at the conventions and at the game stores. But I've talked to so many people where they're an hour and a half drive from the closest game store. I know. You know, so if we can get game clubs started, like chess clubs in schools, you guys listen to this at oh, home. When we hit stop, I'm going to talk to you about I'm going to pull you into that world. Yeah, we need. That's something that we need to do. I think we need to. I mean, it's going to be some pushback against us, but I think we need to do outreach and start with like a chess club in a school for miniatures gaming. Well, we're going to figure this out by lunchtime tomorrow. But Lee, once again, thank you very much. Thank you for having and me. And go go check Gaddis Games. GaddisGaming.com. Yep. Hey, well we're back, and uh, actually today's uh, day three of the. Uh, Historic on 2022 in beautiful Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So we got another great guest here today. And I'm going to introduce Jason Weiser. Um, does Military Miniatures Magazine. Did I yep. get that right? Military Miniature Singular, but that's fine. You know, as long as, it, as long as people know who we are, I'll take it. Singular, Military Miniature Magazine. Yeah. So is the Funny magazine story about small? It. No. What it was was we tried to actually get the Military Miniatures title. But for the S, it was an extra four thousand dollars on the web site. Four thousand dollars. Four thousand dollars. If you needed a vowel, how much would that have been? Uh, I don't know. You might have to ask Pat Ch- Sajak that one. Yeah. Well, you know, he is a local, right? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah, he lives in uh, Maryland. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let's call him. Big, <laughs> big Capitals fan. Big Capitals <laughs> fan. So anyway, so, let, you know, I know I spoke to you the other day, and it's not that I don't remember, but just that nobody was listening was there for this tell me a little bit about your magazine well we got started last year um our first issue was in october of 2021 and uh basically um uh samantha rife our managing editor and she also runs the par- our parent company sjr research she asked me she said hey jason um you've been doing this blog for us um what would the wargaming hobby in the con- in this country really need? And I thought about it for about two seconds. Oh, said, wait, wait. You said a massive pandemic. Huh? Did you say a massive pandemic? Um, mass- I'm sorry. Master- massive pandemic. Massive pandemic. Is that what they need? No, they Blood don't lighting? need a massive pandemic. Okay. All right. Because that would have been pretty cool. <laughs> but it was 2021, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It would have been a little late. Yeah. So what do they need? So what was your answer? I said, look. We haven't had a wargaming magazine of our own in about, uh, well, uh, more than a few years. Um, you know, it's it's been a real it's been a real dearth for us. I mean, I, I, I was saying this, I say this on every podcast I'm on. The Brits are great. 
yes, they brought us, you know, the hobby as it is now in a lot of ways. Right. But let's face it, every time we see coverage of Historicon or Cold Wars or Yeah, it's one or two like, pages. Yeah, it's two pages, and it's in the tone of, oh, look what the Colonials are doing. Isn't that cute? Well, I mean, you know, you have your customer base. So yeah. when you're talking about WSS and uh, uh, War Games Illustrated... I guess they're not coming back on the podcast now. So. Uh, probably not. Yeah, In probably fact, not. I might, I, might, I might get threats of my own. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, they have a mafia. Yeah, I, I, I've heard. They're real, and they're just not scared to use it. So, okay, so you had this idea, and she said, you know, you're crazy. I'm never asking you anything again. No, actually, she ran with it. She, she ran with it. She no, ran. and I've met her, and uh, I don't think you said look. I, I, because with her... I think she was paying full attention to you. But oh, anyway, yeah. go ahead. She ran with it. I mean, we we had the title and the web page probably within a few weeks. We were up and running by September of 2021. And now, when was the first uh, issue out? October. So we really we really pushed it out. And uh, yeah, we we've been going pretty full gangbusters ever since. So it's a every other month. Uh, it was quarterly. We were ever since July. We we're going to go bi monthly after that. So. Bi-monthly. Yeah. So, but we are cutting the size from about 130 pages to 100 pages just because if I try to do, edit 130 pages every month. Yeah, editing's uh, tough. I'm I'm going to go crazy. Our website, if it wasn't for Troy, Troy, and he's an author, so he's, he's a good editor. So, you guys started it. Uh, it's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, I I think you believe, I believe you said, like, hey, our first few were print, and now we went to a digital format. Well, let me... Let me let me correct that. We printed about fifty copies for influencers like yourself. I never got a copy. Uh, I tried to find you. Totally not an influencer. Sorry, I, I'm a bad influencer. Yeah, well, I'm a bad influencer. Um, but we printed about fifty copies for okay. influencers, vendors, just you know, people we knew might be interested. And it cost us almost a thousand dollars to print fifty copies. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it, paper well, has gone crazy. It's full color. It's mm -hmm. quality. Like, there was you guys had some here. It's quality. And it's interesting, you tried to do paper where, you know, uh, when I think I get my War Games Illustrated digitally. Yes, um, but we've been a full digital magazine from the beginning because mm -hmm. we just, again, paper, it's like we did the calculations. We'd have to charge 13 to 16 an issue right? just to make it viable. And that's, well, like, that's look not at, fair to the customer. Look at strategy and tactics, right? If mm -hmm. you get the magazine, I think it's, it's 25. Yeah. And with the game... Forty-five. I, it depends on the on the the issue in the game, but like it's expensive. Yeah, it, it's not. Yeah, I was about to say it's expensive. It's not cheap. It's kind of synonymous. So, so, what was it like getting that first article out? Getting writers, especially motivated writers, uh, <laughs> to provide you content, and it's still a challenge. I mean. I, I jokingly say that half my job as editor in chief is to put my arm around war gamers and go, "Where's my article? Where's my article?" It, it's like the scene in, in uh, Family Guy where um, uh, Stewie says, "Where's my money?" <laughs> okay, <clears throat> most people know I, don't. I, ha I haven't seen all the Family Guy, but yeah. uh, no, I get what you mean. Um, yeah. Believe it or not, uh -huh. with a staff of thirty and uh -huh. no dice, no glory, uh, Troy has to threaten people with severe punishment to make sure they write and we have a benefits package <laughs> um, we don't give medical or dental but we we get great discounts let uh, me guess the benefit is is you don't get hurt well that's that's what we want in an institute and you know like <laughs> we have this thing look hey man if you if you haven't written in a while, we're going to purge you from the rolls because it's it's all volunteers, oh, and, that, yeah. and that's that's kind of the thing, you know. It's the coalition of the willing, mm -hmm. and we get a lot of gamers that come up, and like so, we recently tried to look at board war gamers. I, I want to cover more of that because obviously I play them too. I'm a, right. I'm a tri gamer. I do all all three. I do miniatures, board, and uh, PC or you know video. And it's not easy to get that. And, the, like, a lot of our writers would just wait until we got, like, a free PDF copy of something that new that's coming out. And I'm like, hey, you know, I even said, I'm not going to let you see it unless you promise to write. And they, what, what am I going to do? So it's kind of like herding cats. 
So getting folks, like, how, did you put the word out to get writers or? I find the personal touch works best. I'll go to a convention. I'll see something online. Right. I'll email the guy or I'll walk up to the guy and I say, hey, listen. So you're a poacher. I'm a poacher, and I am proud of it. All right. I mean, I didn't I didn't mean to say that. Oh, no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Listen, a uh, funny story. The guy who has the um, trench display over by the Firelock Games yes. uh, oh, yeah. uh, booth. Yes, Blood and Valor. Great yes, game. Yes, the Blood and Valor guy, he did a really nice job on that. There's rats in the display, guys. Trust me. Oh, yeah, me. yeah. There'll be pictures posted on our website. Yes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he posted an article about it to work Games Illustrated. Yes, he did. But what happened was, and he, the story he told me is, it sat there for months, didn't hear a thing. So then he goes to Wargames Soldier and Strategy and says, hey, would you like to report on this? Well, the same day, wouldn't you know it, Wargames Illustrated gets back to him and Wargames Soldier and Strategy. So yeah. he has to go with Wargames Illustrated because talk to them first. Talk to them first. Well, so Wargames Soldier and Strategy was like, well, who, po who poached you? And he said, I don't feel comfortable saying that. It's not professional. And the first words I, out of their mouth I, I were... I hate to tell you, um, they're going to find out anyway. No, oh, I know. But yeah. um, the first words out of their mouth were, hey, was it military miniature? So, you know, we heard this whole story. We died laughing over at the booth. We were like, that's yeah. funny. You may be a marked man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would make sure you're... Make sure you're unlisted. Is that a little thing anymore? Because there's no more phone books. No, no. It's, I would. I would set up, like, you know, fake fake apartments. Yeah, but, you yeah. You know, um, it's the D.C. area. They're kind of used to that. Yeah, right? I you mean, I, oh, I, Senator, I, I've already told here? my wife, if any strange magazine editors come over, grab the baseball bat and call me. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty rough. And, you know, <laughs> yesterday we had um, Lauren on from Casemate Publishing. Oh, I... And I, 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 I I, I like what Casemate does. By yeah, I, I dig their stuff, and you know we yeah. interview their authors, and I, I dig it. But you know it's like okay, so you get a free PDF book, but get, you got to read it, and then you got to do a podcast with it, uh, with the uh, the author. I I've enjoyed the two I've done, and um, the next one I'm doing is on a book on Strong Vincent, and uh, I'm looking I'm looking forward, but like to, to motivate people to write, and you know one of the things, and you know this is also from doing a lot of game development. You go to social media and a game comes out and it's nothing but like, what is wrong with the game, you know? And it's, it's one of those things that if you had a great game idea, what is preventing you from working with a publisher and getting it out? And a lot of it is it's, hate to say it, and you can hear it by the cacophony of this room, it, we like to talk, sometimes I take action, I get that. Um, so what you guys are doing is not easy. So, looking at the first few art, uh, first few magazines, what kind of articles would a reader find? We're looking for stuff that is of immediate use to the gamer. I want gamers to see this magazine and go, "I can do that. I can try that." Or, "Man, that's a great idea. Let's do that." You know, that's the kind of thing. I don't want a magazine where it waxes eloquent on dice probabilities that most gamers are going to snore through like their 8th so, grade English, uh, math class. So I shouldn't ask Howard West to provide you with any. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah, he loves that. You know, I'm an Orsa, and I got to tell you, yeah, I, I, don't, I find that stuff rather dry myself. So, like, in the first few articles, what, in the first few ed editions, what was the article that you thought, like, this is really good? We got a lot of good feedback on if it. I, if I had to go with it, the feedback we've gotten, that's kind of something weird because... The only feedback we tend to get is when somebody's complaining they, well, haven't gotten their issue for technical reasons. No kidding. Yeah. But, you know, we do get occasional good feedback, and a lot of it's been the how-to articles. People like those, you know, how to do this, how to paint this, how to build this. You know, people like that. They also like the scenarios. You know, when we publish scenarios, that's, right. that's always popular. Um, reviews... You know, hit or miss. Some people like the review. Some people don't. Yeah, you know, and a lot of that depends on the writer, whether or not they actually yeah, like the game. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's, you know, we had an editing issue with the, one of the reviews in the July issue. I thought the guy was saying, because I, I, I do final edit, and it's like, I thought the guy was saying, there's no map for this particular battle. No, he was trying to say there's no map overall for how the armies came together for this particular battle. And writing like, style, writing style. Yes, it's 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 it was hard to figure out. That's what he was trying to say. I, uh, you know, I've 
I've dabbled in writing off and on, and my before Troy, my last editor shot himself um, because he couldn't read my mind. Right, and that's that's a problem that you have in editing. And like you know, when I look at a game proposal, I'm like, I don't know what you mean here because I can't read your mind. Right, <clears throat> and that is so difficult to do because you know, as a as a content creator, whether you're doing a game, writing an article, you have the idea in your head because. Um, we tend not to do assignments. So, like, give me an article on this. You know, I need a thousand words on, you know, then I should know what you're talking about. But, like, we don't have that. And, and you know, yeah. So, hopefully, Troy will stay healthy. Yeah. I care about his health quite a bit. Well, I mean, I, I'm a technical writer by day job. You know, that's that's what I do for my day job. Um, you know, I, 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 I work for a federal client. That's all I'm going to say on the air. Yeah, so uh, you're like the guy in um, Office Space. I talk to the tech writers. Yeah, pretty much. I talk to the tech. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, you know, I love the people I work with. I do. But, you know, I've worked with folks in the past where it was like, oh, my dear God, please don't put that comma there. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so... Um, so is it comma end, or is it just end? No, it's comma end depending on what where you're using it. If it's like if it's two items, it's and. Right. If it's more than two items, you put the comma in. You put it. the it's comma Oxford. before the and. Yeah, exactly. All right. It's Oxford freaking comma. Yeah. You see, I wanted somebody to bring up Oxford comma. You know, it's like I led you into it. Yes, and uh, I, you do know. I the am anti Oxford comma. Yes, and I do do the difference. Know the difference between m dash and n dash. I'm just saying, I uh, we don't use the Oxford comma. Oh no, <laughs> we don't. And and the reason is, well, I'm not going to say what Troy Troy thinks of it, but you know, it's it's the the style's a little bit more loose. So maybe that's why we do it. Right. I don't know. All I know is, I've got Troy has made me and some of the rest of us a, a good writer. So, like, you guys have been pumping out issues now. I guess July was the last one. I think you're on, what, four? Two, uh, originally, it's 203, but it is the fourth issue. Yeah, I, you know, the nomenclature, the numbering nomenclature, it always escapes me. <laughs> Works. It, our podcast has been on season one. So this will be, <laughs> like, season one, ep- episode 140-something. Maybe, I think we're at 150 soon, but... Well, maybe when you get to 150, you'll do season two. And no, no, it's, and it's, uh, you know, damn you, uh, iTunes. iTunes makes you do that. It's the worst <laughs> thing, you know, but it's, because then that changes the numbering. Sequ- I didn't want to get in there because Apple does have a mafia. So, bunch of issues. Where do you get to see yourself, you guys going in the next year or two? What, what are your goals and aspirations? My goal, my goal for the magazine in the next year or two is... I want to get us to we are a recognized part of the industry. We're something where people pick up and say, hey, they said this in military miniature. You know, I want to hear that. But I also want our publishing side because we're publishing several books. Yes. Um, and rule sets. I want us to be the kind of, I don't want to say the farm team, but we're, I want us to be the place where new rules writers and new authors get noticed. Right. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing. So it's. It's kind of funny, like, you know, when you're looking to get somebody to write an article, it, it the person needs to be subject matter expert. So, like, for Blood and Valor, I, I think I did the five-pager in, in War Games Illustrated. Um, you know, I, I know a little bit about it, but, you know, they have these folks sometimes like, oh, it's an article by this guy, not mentioning any names. And I'm like, does this cat still play games? Um and it's trying to get that name recognition. And what's hard here in this environment is like every genre of gaming has their own perceived experts. And online, everybody's an expert. And I know oh, everybody yeah. on Reddit's a philosopher. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome stuff. But um, yeah, so what, what are you guys going to do to get to that? Well, right the hard now, part. the hard part is... No corporate secrets. Yeah, the hard part is is we've got to get our name out there. I mean, that's the number one thing. Get our name out there. Get to get to get people to see the names and faces behind Military Miniature. I mean, we've had some good sales this con, and the reason we've had some good sales, and I told Samantha this, I said, listen, they're putting names to faces. That's what the hobby needs. That You know, Russ Lockwood, who used to run MagWeb, he said... Jason, you're running into a tactile problem because people want, you know, actual magazines. But I say, look, 
if they know us and they know our names and they know our faces and they know we put out a quality product, I think we can overcome the fact that we are a digital po only publication. Yeah. Well, I mean, no dice, no glory is digital publication, and it's it's taken us. We still got some ways to go. Yes. But uh, you know, developing that strategy to get to that end site, and you know, I hate to tell people this, like we've been approached for monetization a few times, but every time that happens, we get another article that goes massive, and it wouldn't be fair for us or for them to quote a price. So, and also, you know, we're free and independent thinkers, so. Yeah, it's not easy. It's really not easy. And, you know, a lot of it is you don't want to flood the zone with information. Um, you know, folks, a lot of times they want to keep it simple. So maybe going down to less pages is probably the best way to go. And then putting that great content in there. So, you know, I, I know we talked the other day and uh, some of our good crayon masters, uh, you know, at No Dice, uh, the ones that Troy approves us, would love to help you out so we'd love to have the help believe me so if i am listening right now and uh, i want to check this magazine out where can i find it how can i get a subscription come to www.militaryminiature.com we have uh if you look at the top of the page and one of the pull down menus i can't do it from memory i'm uh, you'll find talking to me memory is swiss cheese yeah um uh which is good for an editor it's good for an editor. It's not great for, you know. Yeah. But um, one of them will get you the submissions, and that'll get you my email, which is jason at militaryminiature.net. That's also a great way to reach me if you have submissions. And submissions at, and subscriptions. We want, yeah, we want yeah. people to subscribe. Yes, yeah, subscriptions. There is, um, there is also a pull-down menu for subscriptions, and that will lead you right to the part of the page where you can subscribe. Also, I want to say, if you're at the show, come by Booth 105. We are selling subscriptions here, and we are throwing in an extra issue, the last issue we publish. So instead of six issues, you'll get seven. Seven. How much? Uh, okay, so how, mu how much does a year go for? Or twenty six twenty. That's cheap. That's really cheap. I mean, it really is. Um, just you know, comparing to others. So I think it's a good deal. And if you mention those lights of glory, it is still the same price. <laughs> it's still don't you know come on now don't be cheap but um jason thank you no problem and folks, pleasure to be on the show oh yeah well at least we know you'll listen to it you're the guy um but definitely check these guys out um look i i think we need that that speaks to the american audience here um because we do have different interests and you know Sometimes we play the same games. We do play them a little differently, but, uh, you know. Well, I mean, it's, it's when you get into British versus American Wargaming, because uh, a British podcaster asked me, and he said, well, what's the big difference? I said, you're more organized. And what do you, say, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you have your clubs. Everything's Robert's Rules of Order and da da da, da. Yeah. You know, here it's like it's five or six guys meeting in somebody's basement. Yeah, I know about organization. You know, our 12 o'clock tournament started at 1230. <laughs> And it's 12.15. I'm going to Glenn Van Meter. Hey, what time is our 12 o'clock tournament starting? Yeah. And um, the sarcasm is pretty deep. But, yeah, I, hey, check it out. And if you have some content, come talk to Jason. As you can see from this thing, he's easy to talk to. And, hey, tell us what you think of the magazine afterwards. And, Jason, sir, thank you. Thank you. Very much appreciate being on the show. Oh, no problem. Hey, we, we have to talk to somebody. Yep. Nobody wants to hear me. And then uh, we'll be right back. Well, we're back, and I'll tell you what, this has been an interview in the making for quite some time. I have the brain power, and look at that look that he's, I, our audience can see that look, um, behind Blood and Steel, and I'd like to welcome Edgar and Damon Hello. to yes. the podcast. So, look, fan of the game, tell us a little bit about Blood and Steel. All right, I'll take that over. Uh Blood and Steel came about uh, as an idea of understanding how good Blood and Plunder is a game, as a game for skirmishing. And after we saw how Blood and Valor took that over in World War One, we figured, hey, we can do that for another period well, that we like. Blood and Valor tried. Uh, uh, you, you know, I mean, I, Kai carried it. I, let's I be think, honest. Let's give right. the credit where credit's due. Yeah, the brain yeah. trust is is Kai. Yeah, we, you know, it's it, it was all Kai. So we had a chat with the folks at Firelock Games, and uh, they have some plans in the works, and we knew that. 
the Victorian age was something we could fit into, so we were able to get that going. We already had models for that stuff too, and there's a lot of people looking for things beyond things like sharp practice and such. Yeah. So we decided to take that on, and we decided to go big. So we took the entire period. Yeah, I, I noticed that, and uh, you know, first of all, I'll do some shameless self promoting. Go check out our article because we have. Please do. Everything that's in bold is in the book, and I do want to talk about that, but. Man, that is, uh, how many, I didn't count. I think it's in the article, but is that what? It was like 28 lists in total or 23? I don't remember. Well, that's not a complete list of everything we'd like to. It's oh, just we more got a spoiler a, already. Well, it's just, I mean, those are, if you go and look up conflicts in that time period, it's, there's a ton. It's, so oh, we just yeah. kind of like picked out some that were intriguing, but that's by no means an exhaustive list. I'm not saying we're going to even do 28 lists. I don't know. We'd have to. Mike is going to have to cough up, cough up some money for that to happen. But to but. start with, in the core book, we've got six conflicts, and each conflict has at least two different lists. Yes. Uh, you know, Starter good lists. Good guys and bad guys, if you will. So, uh, yeah, the core book has 12 different lists you can choose to go with. Yeah, and I definitely want to talk about that. So when you guys started this project, you know, you had two games to look at, success and failure-wise. You guys... Well, I mean, look, everybody thinks, like, hey, Blood and Blunder's a great game. We all drink the Kool-Aid, but, you know, it's they have t- had some errata, right. and there, there were some, some, some things they needed to clarify. But, like, looking at the games and then taking your design ideas, um, what were things that you guys changed, and what were some things that you knew you had to kind of keep in the game? Well, there was, there was definitely kind of guide rails, uh, on either side and so we didn't want to stray we wanted to kind of use those as boundaries um, the car driven system is, is very cool in Blood and Plunder and uh, Rufus's and Kai's adap- you know, adaption, adaptation of the uh, initiative system is nice I, I, personally uh, there was no events though that could happen in, in Blood and Valor and that was kind of fun so that was one thing that we have made an adjustment to is adding charts to uh, account for bad things that happen and good things that can happen by chance. And uh, the initi- initiative system is different as well. Uh, Blood and Valor uses a uh, pool of initiative that's derived by the unit type. It's going to give you a certain amount. And then Blood and Plunder uses a, a deck of cards that's going to drive how many actions. And uh, Blood and Steel, we use a a dice pool, so each unit's going to generate a dice, or or maybe more in future, um, that you roll, and then you have a bidding against your opponent to uh, determine who goes first in each each successive round, each alternation. So that's one difference. Um, we've also adjusted um, attrition. So attrition in Blood and Plunder used I or not used to be it's. Two above. If you have two more attrition, I think, is when you start. They call it strike points on, on that game. Strike yeah. points. Yeah. Strike yeah. points. Yep. I'm using our terminology. It's, it's superior. Anyway, um, and um, I really don't remember what Blood and Valor is. This is not a slag. I just don't remember. Uh, don't anyway, worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, for you should, us. You just seen Rufus assisting the players um, the other day. Was for, a, for Blood and Steel, though, it's it's basically the first, uh, the first force to three attrition which can be gotten either by uh, casualties or by missions, which we'll go into in just a moment. Uh, at, at three, then you're going to start to want to leave the battlefield. You're going to have to start Slight testing. correction, slight semantic Uh-oh. correction. It's not really the first force to three. It's whenever a I'm force sorry. gets to three. Okay. Apologies. So it could happen that both forces get to three attrition on the same turn, and they both Very have to true. check. Very ah. true. Good correction. Um, I briefly mentioned missions. We have missions as well, so I don't – Neither one of the others have that. Um, right now we have six missions, um, five of which either side can both have at the same time, one of which is a defense, which would not make sense for both to have. So only one can have that. Um, I'm not going to go into the deep dive on the missions right now, but that's a difference between the other two. But the two. highlight on that is that players get the missions secretly. Yeah, they I like that. roll it, ch- uh, pull it off a chit, or if you use cards, you draw it. And so your opponent doesn't know what it is you're trying to accomplish, and vice versa. Well, once you play a game a while, you may be able to figure out what the guy's trying to do. And then there's mind games that come with that, too, because you could 
do something to make your opponent feel or think that you're trying to go for an objective where in fact you're trying to do something different. So the metagaming and the mind games, uh, between the initiative system and the missions, uh, it's, there's a high propensity for that once you get going. I'm trying to think of anything else that might be different. I mean, the bones are the same. The system's good. Right. It's it's not and I, I'll, complex. It's I'll fun. Tell you, I'll tell you my problem, and I'll, I'll tell you sometimes when an idiot I am. So, got the copy of the rules, started playing it, and I'll tell you, the initiative system didn't make sense to me. Why? Because I play the other games so much. So I had a guy I normally play test with me who I never played any of these games with, any Firelock games, is, okay, let's play test this. And we did the initiative system. I go, can you explain this to me? And he explained it to me, and I go, it made, it was after we emailed, it made, it made sense. I'm like, okay, I see what they're doing here. And I had mission creep in a way where I'm, I was too stuck on the other games, and I was looking for what, what is different. But I think once players, first of all, you're new to the system, you will not have the problems I did. But read those rules, play it out, and maybe do what I did. Invite somebody over that's smarter than you to kind of explain it to you. I love, the two things I really dig about it is, is the, um, you have the black swan events, and you have the hidden objectives. I, I love that in games, <clears throat> and you're starting to see that more. A lot of games are having that, where, eh, I don't know what this guy's doing, and it, you said it right, the mind games, which some of the other games don't have. You can have it maybe a little bit here, but I think you're limited sometimes by your force. In Blood and Valor, it's, it's just industrial age killing warfare. No. You're not going to have that. But one of the things I like there, and especially with some of the periods that the game covers, that you kind of have that, ooh, I don't really know what's going on here. And I, I like that. And I think gamers will really respond to that because the mind games, it's, it's really important, I think, in some of these games. It's sometimes how you win the game right. by screwing with your opponent's head. And who doesn't like doing that? Yeah, if you can get them focused on the wrong thing, then you can get what you need to get done. What they say, never stop your enemy while they're making a mistake, right? Yep. And I, I, I like that about it. And like I was saying, I said to you guys earlier, the more I read it, the more I like it. And then comes the other hard decision I have to make as a gamer. You guys cover a lot of, a lot of, a lot of periods here. I want to go into that because I always wanted to do Span Am. Um, I always wanted to do some of the later fights in that period. I, I think they're fascinating. And plus, they have really good movies, man. Who, who here, when you guys were doing the Zulu list, come on, who did not think of Michael Caine? Yeah. Like you have to. So, And there's no lieutenant chart in the game, right? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, not yet. You know, but you got to have the hitch, right? The slovenly soldier. So to hit on that real quick, our approach to the core book was to basically get you the idea on how to play the game and get some lists that will get you playing. Yeah. All along, we knew that we would have to boost that with some supplements that go into a deeper dives that would allow you to have not just the, the randomized missions, but also historical scenarios that you can replay, Hist more historical personalities and things like that. So uh, when I say not yet, I mean, we have plans for that. That's yeah. what we want to get into. We just didn't want to make a $150 book. Uh, I think after people would have. Uh, I think people would have paid for it. So, in other words, if we want to see more, and you explain about that, it's Mike at FirelocksGames.com. Game, That's right. Yeah, flood his mailbox. You know, he doesn't read any of that. No. Yeah. No. Like you have to get him on. I don't oh, know there if he, he knows is. Right how to log in to email. <laughs> yeah, he does. He ne never responds. I even did like help. I've fallen down a well. I still haven't heard back from him. Yeah. It's it's kind of jacked up. So let's talk about some of these periods because I think. That is really great flavor in the book. I, I think the mechanics, and like I said, I was looking at it like from the other point of view. Once I tried to forget all the other rules, which for me is easy, I'm like, okay, all right, okay. Um, there was one conflict in there, and you know which one I'm going to mention because you've been demoing it all weekend. I knew nothing about. How, whose idea was to add that, and was that fun to add in the game? So we're going to blame a friend of ours back in Jacksonville. I'm going to name drop. Maybe he'll start you know? listening to this podcast more now. Well, His then, then we'd have two listeners. Dean K. 
he's got he's from New Zealand. He lives in Jacksonville now, and he's a great guy, great guy to game with. And uh, with him on board, doing some of our play testing and things, getting some ideas from him, we decided to go ahead and include. We wanted some esoteric stuff, some stuff that's not being done to death. So the two that we went with was the Second Seminole War. Uh, we're from Florida, so that makes a lot of sense. And then the other one was uh, the New Zealand Wars. We just had to kind of find which one to go with. We decided to go with the Second Taranaki War in the 1860s. So uh, I'll put you on the spot. Did you know about anything about that before he mentioned it? Nope. Not really. Yeah, okay, so I'm not the only stupid one here. <laughs> Not saying that it, it's stupid, but like I well, look. certain, you know, you get, you get, you. There's certain conflicts that you know more than others, and that's just not on most people's radar. But it should be. So I know we mentioned sharp practice. We'll just call it SP for the rest of this. But you know, a lot of people do lists for them, and they put them on their on their boards. And I know the other skirmish games, like especially for two fat lardies, you just put it up there. And I looked to see if anybody did that. And maybe I didn't look hard enough, but I didn't find a list that. Sp- specifically looked at that war. there was a bunch of wars that went on a bunch of conflicts but i didn't see one that specifically did that did you guys find one because i didn't i think part of the reason for that is we are specifically going for that firefight at the picket line yeah. with few guys it's uh, little fights little fights and most rules dedicate themselves to bigger fights even if it's a skirmish game you still have a bigger fight. You have formed units and things like that. And that may be why a conflict like the Second Taranaki War wasn't covered with any of those. Once we talked to our friend and then we saw the Empress minis they have for that, which are amazing. Yeah, they were really nice. That's when we decided, let's, let's do some research and find out more about this and put it out there. Yeah, I. so we got a lot of, you know, to the article, we got a lot of responses like, what the hell's that? I go, I just explained what the hell's that. There's something called Wikipedia. It's actually on Wikipedia. <coughs> I spelled it wrong every single time, so I'm like, you see, it doesn't even exist. But I thought that was kind of neat. You brought up something great, is in this period, you see a lot of games, we won't mention another one, that, you know, it has those big troops, and, you know, you get general gives an order, and you have to roll a die. You know what I'm talking about. Um, or different types of activation system. This one really, it's, it's, it's about that skirmish fight. It's about that sharp end where the armies meet. And, you know, I think that's an interesting fight, especially a 28 millimeter, because I'm not doing 28 millimeter black powder. Right. Unless I hate myself. Um, and I like that about the game. It has that, that really tactical crunch in it. And there's a big difference between some of these armies, you know. Uh, Zulu and um, the British are one example of it. But, you know, and it, you guys take an asymmetrical fight. Spears versus, you know, uh, what, uh, Henry Martini rifle, and you kind of even it out, which is, I think, pretty cool. <coughs> but like Zulu, that everybody likes that. And I think they like it for the aesthetics, but sometimes the game just doesn't match what you may read in the book, and it definitely doesn't match anything that Michael Caine did in the movie. Right. And he's done a lot of good movies. Yeah, you know, he's one of my faves, by the way. So, but yeah, I, I, I dig that. Seminole War, is that just like a hometown favorite? Well, I mean, yeah, being being from Florida, I mean, it's again, that's not one that I really, I personally didn't have a whole lot of knowledge of beforehand either. But it is a very interesting conflict, and um, so yeah, having why not add a conflict well, in Florida? To be honest, we didn't go into it going, oh, we need to get a game where we can do Second Seminole War. We actually looked. You sure at, about that? No, nah, we looked at the <laughs> conflicts that fit in the period. Uh, she right. was crowned in like eight, uh, 1837, so. What goes after that? And uh, technically, some of the Seminole Wars have begun just before that, but a lot of the fighting happened in the 1840s. Right. So we decided to go with something like that for, again, it fits the period. And it's something nobody else that I know of has. Yeah. So it gives us somewhat of an edge when you're looking at periods. Now, it's a niche within a niche. I understand that, but it's still some different. There is no niche within a niche in this hobby, <laughs> unless you guys have never walked around one of these things. <laughs> I mean, so yesterday, and she was on the podcast, Lauren, I said, you know, Rule 27, I think it's Rule 27 that exists. There was a game version of it. If it doesn't exist, that's the next rule. You got to make it. I think she got the reference. You know, you guys know the reference. 
So there's, this is a niche hobby, you know. In the early colonial, you know, I'm pointing, as everybody can see. You know, they're doing the blood and plunder sea battle. Um, that's a little niche, too. Yeah. And it looks kind of popular, uh, these folks having fun, unless Mike is talking to them. Because, you know, they dummy up. It's like, oh, wait, the designer's here. I got the pressure on me now, you know. But it's like, you know, Mike doesn't know all the rules. So it's all good. Um, going into the Mexican War, and it's what I started noticing reading the book there is you guys have characters in the game. I also had to look up. In your opinion, what was one of the more interesting characters that, as you read about, you had to put in that game? <laughs> Uh oh. I think the most interesting one is coming up. Uh, we love so spoilers here. Yeah. So uh, Count Zeppelin, mm. learning about that dude. Yeah. Uh, you know, until I started doing this, he was the guy who made the dirigibles. Yeah. I didn't know that guy was in the Union Army in 1863, and then went out west and went up in a balloon ride for a little bit, got fell in love with it, then went back to uh, Württemberg and fought in the Franco-Prussian War then went on to become a general and started doing all of that stuff once he retired. Does he deserve a movie? I feel he does. And should Michael Caine play him in the movie? <laughs> Maybe older, I mean younger Michael Caine. Yeah, there is. That's right. Like from like Alfie or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Italian job. Yeah, yeah, Italian job. But bridge too far, kind of in the middle, right? Like... Yeah, that wouldn't work, too. Yeah. There's some okay. interesting stuff, too. Yesterday, uh, Damien here ran a game where it's in the Mexican-American War period. McClellan is out there. He's like a captain, is he? A lieutenant? Yeah. Captain. He's out surveying and stuff, and he gets jumped on by some Lancers. <laughs> and who comes to his rescue, Beauregard. Damien? Beauregard. PGT? Beauregard comes to his rescue, saves his ass, and then later on... They fought. They end up fighting yeah. each other. Yeah. Brother against brother. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, both of them have checkered, checkered military records. I'll just leave it at that. Don't want to get into an argument. Um, yeah, I, I like that flavor. Most people, you know, what do people know about the Mexican-American War? Well, it was dress rehearsal for the Civil War. It wasn't. It was fought differently. No. Yeah. Um, you know, look, we'd only have one verse of the Marine Corps song if it wasn't for that war. Um, so, you know, I mean, we would. Unless you want to do a war game about, you know, when you get to heaven, it's guarded by Marines. But, yeah, I, I like that flavor. And it's like, so I went after I looked at the book and I picked up what was the highest ranked book on the Mexican-American War. And I found it and I actually started reading it because I realized, it, you know, maybe this is a hole in history. And I'm like, okay, because some of the other units, and here's the next question on this. You guys had to do some research here. Like, you had units where I'm like, huh, okay, this is an interesting story all on its own. And you got me reading a book, which never happens. It's taken me years to get through the boys' comics, by the way, and that's mostly pictures, and it's a lot of nudity. Uh, look, I made them laugh. Um, of all the comics to choose, the boys, really. Yeah, yeah. I love the show. That show is something else. It is something else. Um, so... Where was that learning curve that you guys personally did on this three-year project? Like, what was some of the interesting nuggets you pulled out that you put in the game based on what you learned as you were developing it? Uh, I mean, again, I, and I'm still, I, there's still a lot to learn about the Mexican War personally, but uh, the, uh, the St. Patrick's Battalion yeah. and that whole story, how the Irish were treated so terribly that it was <laughs> worth it for them to switch sides. <laughs> um, and there was a whole book written on those guys, I think. There was a story? Yeah, I think they have a whole book written about that. Oh, I'm sure they, yeah, yeah. undoubtedly, I, I think they do. They have a monument still in Mexico. They honor those folks. Um, the uh, the cadets, too, the, the Mexican t cadets who fought to the end. Uh, and, again, there's still just, there's tons to learn about that whole um, that whole conflict. I've got a whole file somewhere. I've got to dig it back. Tell them about the Soldaderas. Oh yeah, the the, the that's women. where I was going. By the way, yeah, yeah, the women who would fight or or tag along, and there, I swear, I found someone who is named, who uh, was basically a female that was a, a essentially a nurse attached to units to help them out, but she actually started or, or contributed in some fighting, I think, and uh, 
I mean, those are just – I never would have stumbled upon that had we not started down this road. So it's uh, it's opened up a whole vista of, of different stories and, and, and even learning more about – history that really is like you said it's just holes that we don't talk about very much now impress the audience you're like you know our goal for writing this was to improve the education of yeah that's right um, it's all educational but you know let's there's a huge tie into this um i could tell you what i'm painting or playing or you could tell what i'm painting and playing by the books that are stacked up by my bedside mm -hmm. and i think you guys are probably the same and i know in game development man that you are knee deep in that stuff because you know a gamer's going to figure something out. Wait, hold on. That button was copper, not, yeah. not silver. And, you know, you guys bring a lot of that flavor out. And I think that's what folks are going to enjoy. So you guys have been here at the con. Uh, this is the third day. You've been running a ton of demos. What, what's that reaction been? Anybody say, Because eh. I, I sat there a few times and I watched. It was very positive. I think it's overall positive. Yeah. Uh, I like it when people come over and ask questions. Several people have come up, they had pre-purchased the book, they came and read it, and then they may be like, why did you choose to do it this way? Or I didn't know about this person. Or Same questions idiots like me ask. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I had a, a person come up to me this morning and say, I bought the book yesterday, I read it overnight, I have a question. I noticed one of the commanders in one of the lists has two initiative, an initiative rating of two. Does that mean he gets two initiative dice? And I said, yes, he does. Which commander oh, was okay. that? Uh, I, he didn't mention which one it was, and I am not ashamed to say I don't remember which one it is. <laughs> I'm like drawing a blank on that, I, the I think it's one of those high-end commanders. It may be um, the prince in the Zulu list. Oh, yeah, that may be. That's yeah, uh, the yeah. king's Ketchewea's brother Yeah. who was leading the, the One of the group. horns, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think he may be the one. I'm not super sure. Uh, I should have known that before no, talking about it. No, actually, not really. No, there's, there's a lot there. So, but it's good to see that people are so enthusiastic about it that they do a demo, go buy the book, read it overnight, and then come back with questions. Yeah. That's great. Hey, did you give them a quiz on it? Should have. Yeah, you should have. You should. Did you read it cover to cover, sir? Um, yeah, I, I felt that, um, you know, looking at it, it's very fertile. And, you know, we, you guys have already spoiled that there's a future here. What's that one period, one conflict that you so want to do that has to be in one of the next books? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm personally am more and more interested in Franco-Prussia, but with that one's kind of coming already. Um, I do like the thought of the Boshin War. Um, Coincidentally, even before some people don't know what that is, and it's Last Samurai. Look up Tom Cruise. Yeah, um, but without Tom Cruise, thank you. Without it'll it'll be a taller guy, and uh, and that he one, can't be a Scientologist. Right? No, I don't think yeah. so. I don't think they were there then. No, they, they Hubbard they, wasn't around. Was anyway, around. so um, that one is personally one that I'm interested in. Yeah, I, I, I remember reading part of a book I had to do for research on the Boshin War, and I'm like, I'm going to get to reading this 700-page book one day, and I don't even know where it is, um, because it's interesting, and yeah. that's the one that is in that Tom Cruise movie. Um, you know, Ken Watabe, right? The badass in that movie. Like, whatever that guy does, I'm watching. Yeah. Him or Michael Caine in a fight. Young Michael Caine against... Ken Ooh. Watabe now. I don't know. That's tough. Yeah. I'm going to have to go Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Because he's probably, he's probably half in the bag already, yeah. so he's not going to feel much hits. Right. So I'm going to give it to Caine in the long distance. Edgar? For that same question, I yeah. think I'm going with Caine as well. Yeah. Same reason. Because he's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Love him. Love him. Great guy. Great guy. The yeah. period I'm looking forward to because of the challenge of it for uh -oh. us is going to be the Box of Rebellion. Yeah, that would I think it's going to be awesome. Diana Preston wrote a book about the Box of Rebellion. If I can find it, I will mail it down to you guys. Awesome. It is an ama it's a great read. Um, and then uh, I forgot the company that did the game on the Box of Rebellion. Um, but that game does not teach you very much about it. It's about defending, you know, the legation there. It is such a fascinating war. And that also had some amazing folks that became famous later on. Uh, a famous drummer and admiral. Uh, I think a British admiral was there. It was very interesting, 
and I think there was eight nations. Yeah. That Charlton Heston, it was great. Charlton Heston, that's that's right. Now Charlton Heston against Michael King. Oh. Charlton Heston? Heston. Soylent we, Green, Charlton Soylent Heston. Green. I'm going Heston. I was thinking uh, uh, the, um, it's not I Am Legend, but it's whatever he did for the I Am Legend. I don't know. That's tough. You know, the cold dead hand statement. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly Stand what sound. I was thinking. So. Yeah. All right, well, we can save that for the next okay. one. But Box of Rebellion, I got to be honest, I was hoping that that would be in there because that that is a learning curve for folks. And... It's a very confusing how that whole thing happened, and it's it's a, like read Diana Preston's book. It is that good, and she really gets into the sex life of the Empress Dowager, which is not bad either. Not bad either, but like you know, the boxers that wasn't even their real name. They called themselves something in Chinese. I don't. My Chinese is rather bad, so Tiger Man. Yeah, Tiger Man. Um, Those dudes are awesome. But yeah, that's that's an awesome one too. That that would be cool. And you mentioned Franco Prussian. People like gaming that. And I'm not gonna say well why, but it's such a fun little period and the learning curve here is it most Americans don't know about it. And that book by uh, Alistair Horn, he wrote the book about Verdun too, um, about the Franco Prussian War is still on like a lot of military universities reading list it's a really good book because it's confusing history and then when it happened after German unification so if France would have won that one you're looking at a different map of Europe yeah. quite a bit and it's one of those well then would, would great war ever happen that you know it's the all whole these, 20th century would have been completely different yeah yeah and then you know you should probably put Otto von Bismarck on it you know it's kind of a goof because the Iron Chancellor, man, I mean, he's... He was the bomb. He was the bomb. I he's don't the, like politicians, but that dude nailed it to the wall. He knew how to be one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, even, you know, I don't know. If you get compared to him, is that good or bad? It depends. I'm going to go if it depends. But how excited you guys are about, like, some of that feedback you got? I know you guys are real tired. Um, but, like, are you going to head back to Jacksonville and start on the next book? Or are you going to take a little victory lap first? What's in uh, store for you guys? We're already starting on the next book. <laughs> Edgar was running a Franco-Prussian game yesterday. So we're, we're already starting on that. So many units. On I'm behind. Sides. We have Actually. a few cons to go to. We're going to Nashcon next month. Yep. Then we're going to Huracan in Orlando in September. And we're looking at potentially going to a Texas con. I think it's called Millennium Con. Uh, that's fairly well attended, I hear. So... Um, November. Spread the, the word. That's in November, yeah. So uh, besides that, we need to uh, get our duckies in a row for uh, German unification uh, wars. Yeah, that, so that's, a, an ex- that's a fairly expansive period, and uh, we got to get it right. So we're going to make sure that we, we work on that pretty well. Because each one of those municipalities or principalities were so different. And, you know, the Germans still had a Bavarian army a Prussian army into the Great War. And, you know, you look at how the Germans thought about themselves as Germans, which you thought would culminate in that Franco-Prussian War, and it really didn't. It happened to generate two generations later when, you know, Germany in 1918 was like finally one nation where, hey, I'm a Bavarian or I'm, a, you know, from Schleswig-Holstein or something like that. It's, it's fascinating. And our German listener, except we probably have one, is probably going to say, you're an idiot. And probably say, like, you know, Schweinhund or something like that. But uh, I, I know a, the reception we got, people are excited about this because it's a real true skirmish game. And we mentioned another one that's out there, but um, that pulpy aspect of it, may, it doesn't suit every player that, you know, your game really focuses on that skirmish fight. So when you guys play just for fun, what's your favorite period to play in the first book? I like Zulus a lot. Funnily enough, I don't have any painted up yet. Do you know I how have, many you have to paint, sir? I, I got a few. I mean, it's yeah. it's not a problem. You got to paint but a they, lot. But they're, they're, I like them. They're a lot of fun. And the Taranaki War is very interesting to me, too. As far as just the, the to me, the prettiest is the Mexican-American, the Mexican army and the Mexican-American conflict. They just were so colorful and amazing looking. That's me. I like the Spanish-American 
War stuff. There's some personal history there, first of all. Second, uh, the, the, the combination, and this is part of the quite sort of ahistorical where you have uh, Buffalo soldiers and Rough Riders and regular U.S. cavalry and infantry fighting together in one army or one force. It's a little odd. You wouldn't really have half companies from each of those fighting together, but that's fine. It's a great flavor, I think. Um, the use of some weapons like that Gatling gun and things like that make it really interesting. Uh, and the, the ability to have allied forces like a Cuban insurgents mm -hmm. or... Yeah, I thought that was in, pretty in neat. In case of the... Eventually we'll get to the Filipino guys too. And the ability to be able to do... With the same models, you can do the Filipino insurrection. Yep. You can do the Moral War afterwards. You can do Spanish-American both in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. Um, and uh, the, the Cuban insurrection or revolution. So... Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that, and, and that's one of my favorites to play out of the book. Uh, yeah. The model line that we're using is awesome, 1898 mini miniature models, I think it's called. And it's, are they, they're not in the United States, are they? No, they're from Spain. Spain. I got I got to brush up on my Spanish. But, uh, yeah, I've seen those models. Those are amazing models. Nobody here carries them? Nope. Which is uh, rather... Actually, supposedly Brigade. Uh, I got to talk to Lon Weiss, man. Where? where? I thought brigade. Somebody I thought said brigade. Yeah, I saw that they have really? some, but maybe oh, not that line. So maybe need, not that line, but yeah, I need they to talk to 1898. Them. Yeah, 1898 has two lines. One's for the Span Am, and the other one's for Tercios. Yeah. So, yeah, I saw them in a store in Madrid. It was amazing. Unfortunately, I was with my family, so I couldn't buy a whole line. You just know your wife's never listening to this. I needed so. them to step yeah. aside. Yeah. yeah, you know, we have no women listeners whatsoever, and the guys that listen to while they're painting use use earphones, dudes. I mean, come on now. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, Span Am has always been. I've loved reading about it because it's a war we kind of created, and then like the first time we ever had a general officer have a, have a battle flashback was General Wheeler. He said we got the Yankees on the run. Like, you're a Yankee now, boss. Yeah, well, I'm thankfully we were able to sit down about this and talk about it, and then you know I'm excited for the future of this game. Um, I haven't painted in a year and a half, and I'm using that book to paint up some Span Am, and um, kind of excited. I want to do Buffalo Soldiers, Rough Riders, being from New York, Teddy Roosevelt, Hamilton Fish, you know, you you got to have that in a game. So I'm excited about. It. But I want to thank you guys. Please come back, and as, as you guys hit successive books, and you can find the game at firelockgames.com. And can you go over again where you're going to be in the next few months? Besides well, home. it looks like we're going to NASHCON. That will be in August. I don't know the exact dates. I think it's 19th. I think it's the uh, 19th, 17th 20, through the 22nd, something like maybe that. Maybe somewhere in there. We're going to Huracan, which is HMGS South. Yeah, that's good. in the Orlando area. Good con. That's, that's September late September. Second through the fourth. Then 25th. we are not quite fully committed to perhaps maybe if the spouses are okay with it, it may become with us. Go to Millennium Con in November. What town is November. that in? Austin. I think it's in Austin. Have you guys ever been to Austin? I have been to Austin. No, I have not. You, Austin's pretty cool. And, you know, we have to plug Austin. We get sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce. But, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And I think folks are going to love playing this game. And, uh, hey, I think we're done with all the interviews this weekend, so we're going to turn it back to the studio, and we'll speak to you guys soon. Glad you saved the best for last. Yeah, that's it. We did, awesome. actually. Thanks. Hey, we're back, and I'm joined once again by... Thomas Mullane, the Flapjack and King. How you doing, Tommy? You look tired. I am very tired, Mr. Reed. Yeah, what's up, my man? Uh, your snoring kept me up, and I'm sure my snoring kept you up. Yeah, you could have put the ear things in. Your snoring did not keep me up because I had the ear pulse. I don't know. It seemed like more of an adventure to, to just not try. Yeah, obviously. Normally, so, I'm so tired, I just fall right asleep, and it doesn't wake me up. Yeah, and I think you're heading home tonight, too. What's that? You're heading home tonight. Yes, I do head home tonight. It's a six-hour drive. No, it was a six-hour drive from Lake George. It's only a three-and-a-half-hour drive back to Danbury. Yeah, I think you're going to die on the road. but I'll be fine. Yeah, okay. All right, you're sure about that? I worry about it. Can you text me that you got home okay? I, I'm not going to check until tomorrow morning. I love that you love me. Yeah. But I'll be okay. Okay, that's good. Well, 
it's going to suck because I got to go go to your funeral, and you know, I I know, I know your wife. So of course, of course, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be well. Hard. It's, gonna be uh, hard it's day problem. three. We yeah. were here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's day four. I can't count. Yes, yeah, day four. So uh, we're, it's it's the fourth day. Yeah, it goes into tomorrow. You st- you you are also going home tonight, correct? Yes. Yeah, and you know the funny the funny thing about the fact that you know we're both leaving. Sunday gaming sucks. We used to have this thing like Sunday rugby sucks, right? Yeah, it was super fun. Yeah. So, uh, so all right, let's wrap up like kind of what we did over the last few days here. Um, we had Oak and Iron. We did. And who won that bad boy? Oak and Iron was won by uh, the incomparable David Wolf. Okay, incomparable. Uh, he's he's finished second in more tournaments than I can count. Yeah. And he finally got his gold medal, which I was really excited about. He's for the him. kissing your sister award. Yeah, yeah, and that was it. It was oak and iron. Uh, then we did blood and valor. Correct. Uh, James uh, uh, Wilmot won that, right? Dave yes, Wilmot. He did. Yes. yes, with his Bulgarians. Well, his whatever dressed as Bulgarians. I forgot what he uses. He was playing that. Ottomans. Yeah, Ottomans dressed yes. as Bulgarians too. He's a good player. And uh, then we also wrapped up that day. Uh, with a run through of Blood and Plunder. And Blood got, and Plunder. Who won that bad boy? That was won by Joe Forrester. Blood and Pigment. Blood and Pigment, all the way from Oregon. You know, that he's kind of our competition. He is, but. Well, we, not really. Not really. We keep sending him stuff, and I keep cross posting his things because it's a fun website, and he's a nice guy. He's a nice guy, yeah. I never met him before. So the, the, the rankings on that one was Joe Forrester first, uh, David Wolf second. Then Jaden King finished third on the strength of dealing out 10 strike points to his opponents with yeah. his Scottish militia. And that the, uh, amazing list. You know, I played oh, the yeah. crap oh, yeah. out of that list. Yeah. And favorite opponent went to Andy Hodges. Yeah, uh, lo- love Andy. He's great. He's awesome. He's awesome. So let's uh, look at this. This is going to wind down, too. And it would be interesting to know who wins this. And, you know... You'll know by the time this comes out on Tuesday who won because you guys. Yeah, but as we're it. talking, the third round is underway. Me and Tyler uh, both played in the tournament, and Glenn showed up for the final round to kind of run everything. Yeah. So this is the largest ship tournament we've had. Yeah. It, it, to my awareness, we've had we had fourteen. You had fourteen. Uh, and I came into this expecting to lose badly, and uh, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Uh, but I did have a first. You, as far as Mike Tunez is concerned. You won. I sank a ship. Oh. Which Mike said has never happened in tournament play. Well, there hasn't been that many tournaments. Yeah, I know, I know. But I'm still excited to be the first person ever to sink a ship. So when I was demoing this at uh, Huzzah, you know, you roll the critical tables. Yeah. And uh, I think it was third turn, ship blew up. Yep, blew up. Yeah. I set this guy on fire. And I'm then blew up his fire. rigging, and then sprung three leaks. I'm on fire. So, you know, I that ship was that ship more, sailed. It's more ocean than than wood. We also had another first. Chris, behind you, Bailed yes, him, won his first game. He did in a tournament by beating Nigel. By beating Nigel, and no dice, no glory guy. Is he still no dice, no glory guy? Or he just wanted to get some little glory, and then he, he went only to wrote the one article. But I'm going to keep on him to, to write some more. He yeah. may have lost his. No, I, Miguel, I love you, but you also bear the dubious distinction of having gone 0 for nine in tournament play. Uh, he lost to uh, a very astute 12 year old in Blood and Valor. Yeah, but he finished third in that. He did finish third, um, but yeah, he got he got his clock cleaned. He, yeah, I think he was overconfident because of just how much he'd beaten me up whenever we play. But that goes to show you, don't design a list to beat one player. Because <coughs> it's yeah. easy to do and it doesn't have any it, universal applications, I'd say. Yeah, it's, you're playing a meta of two. Yeah. Ugh. It's a meta of two. <laughs> meta of two. That's a meta. Yeah. So I, I, I go home energized with tons of projects I want to do. I'm sure you have the same feeling. I haven't painted in a year and a half, dude. And, but uh, I'll tell you what. Go ahead. Um, spoke to the guys from uh, Blood and uh, Steel. I like those guys. And I'm, I'm going to do a uh, Span Am. 
okay. army, and uh, because they're going to expand it, they gave us a lot of spoilers into the Philippines. <coughs> yeah, I think I'm going to go there. You love a lot of obscure theaters that That's don't right. get a lot of love. Well, I mean, they have that second Taranaki War. I never heard of that before. I thought that was interesting. I hadn't really heard of that, no. Yeah. You know, I thought it was like tahini, you know, the stuff you, the, whatever, that Greek, uh, was it Greek yogurt or something, right? Or is it, it I don't even know, tahini. You know, it sounds tahini. like a, sounds like a delicious. top bikini, yeah. You need that to make hummus. <coughs> do you need tahini to make hummus? You do, yeah. You Almond ma- paste. You've made uh, you made hummus? Yeah, I made it from scratch. It's way better. So metrosexual. Is that a you, word now? You just need a you need a food processor. That's yeah. all you need. So let's let's just recap. Um, we spoke to some cool people. I spoke to more cool people. You did, yeah. <coughs> um, I don't know who my favorite is, man. I, I thought that they were all amazing guests. Um, I, I think that we covered the gamut of, you know, game designers, um, you know, uh, the guys from, uh, you know, Jason from the magazine, uh, Lauren, uh, Lee Gaddis. You know, it's funny. I've been friends with him online for such a long time and finally got to meet him. And he's an interesting guy. Anytime I can hang out with Nelson Martinez and the guys from Mythicos. No, I Nelson's the so. best. Yeah. Um, Nelson, Nelson, I'm going to go over to his store and do some demos for them. He actually preferred you did not do that. Oh, he doesn't want me to do that. Yeah. He said something about you going to the bathroom a lot. I do. I drink yeah. a lot of water. And um, so, you know, we, <coughs> we played Tales of the uh, Tales. Um, Shorts of Tripoli. Okay. Yeah, that we did. our first game. We uh, did. We showed Mike that game. Great game by Kevin Bertram, Fort Circle Games. Um, Who you put me in touch with, and yes. I'm going to help him play test Halls of Montezuma. Yeah. And if you know anything about the Marine Corps song, the third game in that installment is about heaven. Nice. Yeah, because it's the third verse. Anyway, so all the Marines. I am there. disappointed I missed talking to Lee on here, but we did talk off the podcast. And, yeah, we did. And he's great. I bought yeah. his rules. Yeah. I got the last hardcover copy, which I was psyched yeah. about. So th- I'll tell you the guys that I wanted to have on this, but I think we're going to get them later. Are the two guys from Clash of Sp- doing the Clash of Katanas game? Um, they're originally from um, Buenos Aires. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Great guys. They they like here. Uh, he's like, we love your page, and I'm like, you're the guy. You know, I always do that. It's Clash of Spears, right? It's yes, Clash of Spears. Clash yeah. of Spears. I tell you, I looked at it. I think um, first I got to start painting again, but I think Ancients is just something I'm going to get into because it's slowly pulling me in. I mean, Command and Color is Ancients. It's board game. But I think it looks fun and interesting, um, you know, and it's – I noticed that the rules for, you know, ancients, things weren't complicated back then, you know. So maybe I'll get into that. No, a lot of the – I think the, the busiest game tables we saw down here in the tournament hall were mostly um, – like you had a lot of DBM, you had a Triumph. That's uh, always. You, you, they're always busy. Because um, it's not overly complicated. You, yeah. you resolve the fight between the rules, and there's different. But the models look great. You know, it gives you a chance to paint for people that love that aspect of the hobby. Yeah. And uh, no, they they were busy down here. Yeah, they were busy down here. So, uh, I will also say that the the Mythicos hosted bolt action tournament went great. Yeah, Calissa, um, uh, Calissa, uh, Calissa and she, her husband. They're, they're, you know, it's funny. He has a name. I know. Do you know what his name is? I, I met too many people this week. Do you know what his name is? I talked to her more. What is his name? I don't know, Mitch. Dave. No, I don't. It's Dave. It's Dave. Dave. Okay. What, what's, what's, what's their last name? Oh, you see, the Irish cannot say Polish names. Oh. Sabeki. Sabeki, yes. Yeah. I was glad to finally meet her after talking to her online so many times about different uh, warlord events. So, you know, we got some breaking news ourselves. We sat down with Nelson. We sat down with uh, Le Petit Cubano. And uh, we're cooking something very exciting up for next, next Historicon that we may try in the Cold War's Fallen. And uh, we, since it's kind of in the Genesis phase, we're not going to reveal it. But I think fans of Mythicos games, fans of Firelock games, will really enjoy what we're cooking up. And um, more to follow on that. I mean, we got plenty of time. Yeah, there was a meeting of the minds this weekend, so more <laughs> that, to come. Is that what you call it? Yeah. So other than gaming, uh, what were some of the more interesting things uh, this weekend? Um, Flight of the Concords. 
Yeah, Mitch introduced me to Flight of the Concords. Yeah. He was playing some of his favorite Kirby Enthusiasm episodes. Yeah, the ski lift, if anybody's Comedian asking. Nikki Glazer. Yeah. The, the world's cleanest comedian. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm glad I got to share that with you because I enjoy it. My my one of my favorite things this weekend is when you came out of the shower today and it looked like you got into a fight with another inanimate object. Yeah, yeah, I did. I cut myself shaving. Yeah. And I'm thinking that's not the way to kill yourself. You know, I was impressed with you that you didn't comment on it until this moment. We we, yeah. we went the whole day. Yeah. Uh, Nigel couldn't help himself. He kept telling me I had a Cindy Crawford mole. Yeah, you did. It's uh, you know, but it, you know what it is. It's like it's. A, I can't stop looking at it. It's yeah. Uh, yeah I think a hair molly, is molly, growing. Molly, molly, molly. Yeah, you got you nicked yourself up pretty good. I did. Yes. And you know, Tom uses a, a double bladed straight razor. I, yes, I use a straight That's razor. That's not a straight razor. I use a straight razor. I use a safety razor. A safety. Yeah. Safety razor, yes. But uh, maybe try one of those. Or you were just so tired, you're just like, fuck I was it. tired. It's very rare that I cut myself. Yeah, it but is. But I it was is. unlucky today. Yeah, and you don't, you don't have to shave for these events. I shave every day because Why? if I don't shave for at least one day, I, I really do look homeless. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that about you. You did, you, yes, you've noticed that. Your uh, comportment is always professional. I've always looked at you I can't pull off a beard. The other guys yeah. on our writer staff can. Yeah. You know, you can. I can when I had it. So who has the best beard in No Dice, No Glory? What was that? Who has the best beard? Right now we're looking at right now, Glenn and uh, Tyler. So when Glenn's beard gets wild, um, yeah. it he looks like he was lost in the wilderness for four days. Does he look like a homeless like Amish Like hunting guy. a bear. He yeah. looks like a homeless Amish farmer. Yeah. But uh, it's trimmed. It's trimmed. I think uh, Tyler Glenn, just has great hair. Tyler does, yeah. Tyler yeah. does. And was there any new terms? Or songs you learned this weekend that you... Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to share those terms with the poor, unfortunate souls that are listening to this podcast. Well, they'll have to go look it up. We're not going to define it. What was that word? You can share them with them. You're flap, not going to make me jacket. say these things. I already said flapjacket. Flapjacket. HBO is really into flapjacking. Uh-huh. And if you can email Tales of the Sale or... Uh, yeah, email the Tales of no, the Sale. No, no, If you know what... Do not send what, us emails what about the definition of flapjacking. And what am I talking about when I'm saying flapjacking in HBO? That is not our trivia contest for the week. It, it should be. It should not be. Yeah. I'll tell you what, it's ten times more interesting than... Uh, well, you've been telling me you have plenty of Urban Dictionary uh, yeah. entries that you're very proud of. I'm very proud that of That you it. feel personally responsible for. I, I do. I, look, there's little I can hang my hat on uh, so far in my life. But, you know, look, another Historicon is going to come in the books. Did you miss big live events... Yes, you, you, I, they can't. They can't see that on on. Uh, on I a missed. Podcast. I missed getting to see this many people. Yeah, I missed getting to see these insane tables. Like insane. The, the, the participation table. Like one that I'll I'll single out. I think won the prize is the one that they did based on the Western TV show. From yes. the 1950s. Yeah, it was awesome. I, I will write an article and post pictures. I took a lot of pictures yeah. this weekend. Um, but it's it's a four board setup. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. There's, you can even look in the inside of a mine. And I heard that they use gunfighters ball. They what? They use gunfighters balls. What I heard as nice. a game that, engine. It's a good rule set. It, I, I, I liked it when I, I demoed it with them. You I know? play it. It's awesome. It's a good light game. And if I want to get folks into, because it has that right amount of pulp, and it's too bad Forrest wasn't here because he's doing um, uh, the Twisted Lords event. But uh, it, it was, you know, it was great seeing everybody. What yeah. was uh, the big purchase you made? You you walked away at the German Village. Oh man, uh, biggest purchases I made were for Saga, because I, I wanted a second army that I could use with students. Students. Because I already have Irish, and I wanted to buy the Vikings. Why'd you get the Irish? Because my, my, my family is Irish. So. That explains so much. Me and my sister both got that DNA test. Yeah. And uh, mine came back as 35% Irish, and she only came back as 24% Irish. So, so I win. You know. But doesn't that mean one of the two of you? Like, no, no, okay. The way math works is yeah. you get a different 50% from each of the parents. I get that. So, yeah. So I'm right. more Irish. I know right. that you're not identical twins. I know. But, like, statistically speaking, you said 24 to 35? Yeah. The rest of it is German or Italian yeah. or I, I'm still thinking that there's, there is some math problems there. Dude, I know, I know math. Eng what are you, a history teacher? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's why. Yeah. 
Just because you took a course in economics, man, doesn't make you... Uh, it was the worst thing in the world. Yeah, it's totally bad. But uh, Sorry to all the economists out there. Yeah. So, great time. Great seeing everybody. Uh, I'm tired, and I got to get up Tuesday and do this again, which will be the podcast following. So, hopefully, this will be out, the, hopefully, on Tuesday. Yep. Which, for you guys, is today, in case you don't know. <coughs> but, um, yeah. You can hear the tiredness in our voices. But, you know, overall, great time. Thanks for HMGS for hosting. Uh, you know, Mike was complaining that we didn't have him on. And I think it's like, you guys have Mike on all the time. No, he was on like three three months in a row one time. Yeah. So yeah. he needs a break. He needs a break. He, I'm sure he's tired of being asked about the, the Kickstarter. I'll just throw out there that it's scheduled for release sometime September, October. Yeah, right. But this fall, they, they have a beat on it. It's coming out of Cal, you know, it's coming. Yeah, it's, it's coming. They, they've it's done coming a lot of work out on, on it. February. Um, I will also just say before we sign out for this segment piece, yes, that, this is the uh, this is it. It's the finale. This is it. Uh, but I, uh, I will be at Mythicos on August sixth uh, oh. for demos of Blood and Plunder. What happened on August sixth? What's up? What famous history event happened on August sixth? You're putting me on a spot, and I don't know. I'm too tired to know. You dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Do you celebrate that day? I should have known that. Do you celebrate it? I do not. Yeah. And know. if you were to celebrate it, how would you celebrate it? Uh, You're getting bombed, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sure, Mitch. With being 24% Irish. Yeah. Uh, when we get off, I'm going to explain to you math. I uh, know. A little bit. I know. Right. It should have been closer. It should have been within 5 five to 8%. But anyway. No, four days of this will take a lot out of you, but it's... It's an awful lot of fun, and it's well worth coming down. So yeah. if you weren't making it here this time, come to Fall In. We'd love to see you. Yeah. And um, if you are in the North Jersey area, New York area, Mythicos. area, come to Mythicos on August 6th. Right. And I'll be running games for six, seven hours. Yeah. And they got Tom plenty of product because they've, they've loaded up. Nelson's ready. Nelson's ready. He's ready. And they're, they're great. It's a great yeah. store. He is. And uh, Tom, great roommate. So are you, man. Yeah, you flapjacking mu- Anyway, uh, so we're going to send it back to Sean. In this, you know, Sean was really impressed because we had him on not too long ago. We still have him on here. That that he's he's the the actual intro outro, and he goes, "How old is that?" I go, "Since we started." I miss Sean. Sean, if you yeah. listen to this, we'd he like do- you to come to one he of these. Doesn't. Please, nobody listens to this. No, no, no. Do you listen to this? Do you listen to the other podcasts? I listen to the ones I'm not on usually. Really? Yeah. Oh, so what do you think of the last one we did? Uh, uh, oh, I didn't uh, listen to it yet. Oh, yeah? Well, so you haven't... What about the last one you listened to? That's what I said. Yeah, look at it. He doesn't listen. Yeah. It's been a busy summer for me. It has, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to pack up and head back to West Virginia Studios, and we'll send it back to Shawnee. Bye! Thanks so much for joining the show tonight. Remember to follow us on Twitter at No Dice, No Glory. And keep the conversation going on NoDiceNoGlory.com, now featuring our own message boards. Have a great night, everybody.